Okay, everybody, Larry Lawton here for another great edition. We're starting our podcast and with YouTube. So for the first time, I said, let me get the best guest I know. I want to get Paul Tolini. But before I start, please check us out on all the platforms. Please check us also out uh, on our YouTube Patreon membership, our uh, uh, YouTube membership, Patreon membership. And please join Larry Lawton's Action Crew. We're changing lives every day. Now, without further ado, and you guys are going to catch a glimpse of one of my closest friends to this day, from prison to the, to the free world, and I'm going to introduce Paulie. How you doing, buddy? Great. How you doing? <laughs> Hello, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to just have fun, everybody. Paulie and I, a uh, little, little backstory. Paulie and I went to prison together for a while. Paulie did 30-year sentence uh, for 50 kilos of coke. 100. It was 100. 100, was 100. kilos of coke. And he mm-hmm. did his time, he didn't rat, went away, and him and I were the two people in the prison system, the Federal Bureau of Prisons. We were in Edgefield. It was a crazy place at the time. And Paulie and I were ones who fought the system. Me, mostly inside, fighting against the abuses and stuff. Paulie from the outside, meaning helping guys with cases. He is one of the best l- legal minds I know. I won't say a lawyer, because him and I are both paralegals, we can't be lawyers, so we'll never say that, but we know a lot more than most lawyers you'll ever know. Without a doubt. And, you know, I thought I'd bring Paulie on board because we have, you know, whenever we get together, we just start rapping, we start talking stories, and I'll tell you everything funny, guys. It's probably the funniest stuff you're going to hear. But, Paulie, bring him back. Tell him how we met when I, when I pulled up to Edgefield. When Edgefield, when he first came on the compound... You know, everybody liked him because he, he was already well-known in the system, and we all got along great. You know, it was just like a welcome-home party, you know. Best part was uh, I went into the same unit as Paulie. Uh, so that, we we were on eight, A1. A1. A1, unit A1. A1. Just to give you a little idea, how, no, it was no, B1. No, A2, A2. Was it, no, was it yes. B or A? A2. A2. How A2. it works is you had, you had uh, A building, B building, and C building. And then you have A1, A2, A3, A4, which is three and four on top, A1 and two on the bottom, and vice every building. We had about, what, 1,500 inmates, I think it was? Uh, yeah, probably. Probably fifteen to 1,800, depending on how crowded it was. Well, they tried the three men in the room trick on us. Listen, they tried to put three men in the cell. Mm-hmm. Paul, tell them what happened there. We, they, they, they come in, their cells are built for the, you know, 8 by 10 or whatever, 8 by 12, they're little eight tiny 10, rooms. if that. <laughs> and, and they have, you have everything in there. You had two bunks normally, and then you had two lockers and your toilet. So they got the brainstorm that they're going to put in more people. And we, we, what they did was totally illegal. I give them any standard. And they put a bunk bed over the two lockers. And that was the third bunk in the cell. So we were like sardines. First the they started putting us on the floor. They had us on the floor, then they did three, if the high ceiling, if they had the big ceilings, they had three bunks up and then you only had like 24 inches or 36 inches from the ceiling actually right, to right, your that, bed. I remember that. And guys were smacking their heads up there. It was just terrible. It, you know, and now we're talking about a penitentiary. We're not talking about... Paulie and I never did times in Lowe's or camps. No, or we, we didn't. We weren't fortunate. <laughs> we weren't fortunate or, I guess, good enough. Mm-hmm. We both bucked the system a lot. So we're, we're going to talk a little bit about some good news we just had. Uh, to this day, when Paulie got out of prison, he started a prison... Liti- uh, the t- American Litigation Consultant. Where he does is he takes a guy's case, he really looks at it, before lawyers, before lawyers charge you crazy amounts, boy, you're looking, be honest, and tell you if you got a case or don't. And that's real important in this business because you get screwed. Sorry, a lot of lawyers just want your money. We, we were never like that. That's why Paulie and I got along so much. We helped so many people, even new dudes coming to prison uh, mm-hmm. when they got out. Well, when Paulie got out, tell me what you did and how you started it and, and what you do. Well, first, when I got out, I, they, they, Larry picked me up at the airport. I was oh. lost. <laughs> I told him so about you that. Have to, you have to understand that I hadn't been in society for quite some time, for decades. So. He went to prison in 89. I think I picked you up in mm. 17? Uh, oh, uh, no, in, no in not 2014. 2014, I picked Paulie up, oh. and he was in since 89. 
So he was behind the walls, never seeing a free air piece of air for 25 years, 26 years almost. 20, 25, 28 years, four months. He didn't see, whatever it is, he ended up having a fucking crazy. So it's so funny. The first thing I said to Paul was, says, Paul, just, I'll pick you up because I know what it was like to get out. Sure enough, he did everything I told people he would do. But tell him what happened when I picked. What, what did we do? Smoke these here cigars. This is my <laughs> second Cohiba. And no, all this these was, that was a Cohiba. These are Flora de Olivas. Yeah. They're good. I don't know, but they're pretty good. They're just big. <laughs> <laughs> but tell them what happened. How we went to the house. You were nervous. Oh, I was it, nervous. I said, come on, we got to go. We're bullshitting in the parking lot. And I'm already nervous because I'm saying, lad, they're going to send my ass back. <laughs> I didn't ask to come here. I didn't ask them for it. I wasn't ready. I was uh, nervous would be an understatement. And I'm lost because when, when I first, when I got out and I went to the, um, the, the airport with the two security guards, I asked Oh, them they to, put you, you didn't get on a, pl you got on a plane. I got on a plane. Yeah, see, I got on a bus when I got yeah, out. Yeah, they took me, they took me right to the airport because I was going to Miami. So, so they, two they, guards two actually guys drove you to the airport. Drove me to the in airport. In handcuffs or no? No, no. Oh, no, you, you could just have drove me to the, to the airport and, uh, you know, I was, I was nervous about walking away from her. I didn't, you know, you know, so I asked them if I could use the bathroom and they started laughing. They said, listen, you're free. You can do whatever you want. You just can't go back outside the security checkpoint, you know. They had to make TSA. sure you got on the plane. They just was there to make sure I was on the plane. So I said, okay, well, let me use the bathroom. I went over and used the bathroom. And after I got finished using the bathroom, I went to flush it. I didn't know how to flush the toilet because it's all sensors, <laughs> right? And I laugh about it now, but it wasn't too funny then, you know. A guy looked over at me and he seen that I was like a little confused and he said just back away from it and I was like what you know because I'm in a bathroom with some guy talking to me I never seen before <laughs> yeah. in my life you I know? didn't even think of that and and I'm like okay and I backed away and the toilet flushes so then I'm over at the sink to wash my hands and I'm looking for the pedal or something there's no handles the same thing he said no just wave your hand under the faucet so I weighed my hand under the faucet. I feel like I'm fucking stupid, right? And I wash my hands, and I tell them, thank you, and I leave. And then I said, okay, I'm, that wasn't too bad. Let me get a little bit more. I went right back to the cops, right back. Yeah. Right you know, back to that. I, I tell people what happened to me when I got out is I was so messed up. I tell you that story about the bus and everything. But what happens, I felt more comfortable when I got into the halfway house. And I know people say, what do you mean? Because I wanted to be, I, I, I wasn't ready. Because the BOP, the Bureau of Prisons, they don't do shit. They give it lip service. They don't explain or tell anybody really what's going to happen, no. how you're going to feel. They might try to say, oh, you're going to get this. You can try to go get your driver's license. Do they don't get the feelings guys have when you're institutionalized. Because we were totally institutionalized, you know. Mm -hmm. you, you, and, we're, and now you're talking about two highly intelligent guys who did the law, watched the news. We thought we were, you know, ready for anything. And Paulie, how, how fucked up were we? We were real, we was real fucked up. I was fortunate enough that I had you to help me, you know yeah. what I mean? To help me adjust and everything. And, you know, when I got to the, when we was uh, sitting in, in Miami smoking the cigar <laughs> in the parking lot, and we're bullshit. This is in the airport. Yeah. We're literally, I brought a Cohiba. A Bahiki Cohiba cigar, which mm. you guys should know what those is. You look it up. And we, I said, Paul, we're lighting a cigar. And he's like, he's all worried about, can you rock, can you smoke here? Can you do this? He's all fucked up, and I'm yeah. laughing. Yes. But it's kind of sad. It, it shows how yeah. people are not ready to get out. They're not. Listen, when I came off of that plane and I was walking down the, uh, well, in Atlanta, when I got, because I had to fly from, from, Pennsylvania to Atlanta. But I want to stop. Look up right now, everybody, and look at the picture of Paulie when he went to prison. That's what Paulie looked like when he went to prison. And now you're going to show another picture, and that's going to be Paulie's driver's license today. Look at that. No, that's my. That was just my Florida ID. Florida they ID. They made me get an ID. They wouldn't give me my license. They said that I had uh, tickets from 1986, and I just got it resolved Friday. Are you kidding me? Right now? For real? Right I mean, now. This now. I We're talking it. in 2020. Yeah. I just 
resolved all the problems. And this is how, how the system is. In Massachusetts, that's where the tickets were from, right? So I had to pay a $200 reinstatement fee plus $115 for the tickets, right? I don't even remember the tickets. <laughs> how and could you? It's 40 yeah, years it's ago. fucking 40 years ago. And I, I was like, okay, because you, I want the license. I have a Colombian driver's license, motorcycle license, driver's license. Paulie's wife is from Colombia, and Paulie has a daughter as well. And that's a great story we'll talk about a little bit too, but go ahead. But they have... Uh, He's laughing now. <laughs> they have, they, they had, took it until yesterday, I went to my appointment down here to get my license, because they told me I was cleared, I paid the fines, right? So I said, okay, I'll just pay them at the registry. Well, they didn't take me out of this national registry that they have. If you have anything in any state, and you're in that registry, you're not getting nothing. So they're all linked now. They're all linked. Back in the day, it's, you were... We, if you got in trouble in um, Boston and you went to... to Massachusetts, uh, Connecticut, New Hampshire, Connecticut. New Hampshire, Connecticut. anywhere you get a license, there's no problem. But what they do now is everything's connected. And Massachusetts wanted the $200 for the reinstatement fee. They didn't want me giving it to Florida. So I paid it. Took me two seconds to pay it on the phone. Right? Oh, you did it right on the phone? Right on the phone. I gave, she says, oh, everything's ready. We got all the documentation. Everything's fine. All you have to do now, Mr. Tallini, is pay us that $200 reinstatement fee. And you can do that right now on a credit card. I <laughs> said, well, here's the card. You know what I mean? Here's the card. And she said, okay, everything's clear. You can get your license now in Florida. Just go and make another appointment and you're in. So I have an appointment for the 24th of August and I'm going to go get my license. And then I'll feel really legal. 24th you know. of August is a date of mine. That's my actual date I get now, 13 years Is ago. it really? Yeah. August 24th. That's when I went to Columbia. 2007. I got out August mm -hmm. 24th. I went to And, <laughs> you know, a, a Paulie and I were talking beforehand, everybody, and we have stories. And we could sit, and we're going to, we're going to, this is going to be a different kind of show because you're going to hear some crazy stories, fun stories. But Paulie just did something that, that really hit, you know, we're close. And we stay in contact no matter where he is, from Columbia to... United States, Virginia, he has a brother in Virginia, I think he's a brother in Virginia. Yeah. And uh, so we always stay in contact. And we have a friend who had, uh, I'm gonna let Paulie tell you, we have a buddy of ours who was like us, did law work. I know Nick since 96, the year I went in. Nick and I hooked up, Nick does funny as shit. He's a, he, we call him a, a prison chiropractor. Oh, that's such he's a great. Fucking, yeah, but he's fucking doing this shit to me. I, you know my fucking back. I, I look back now. I, oh, yeah, I can really sue him for malpractice. <laughs> anyway, Nick uh, is a good friend of ours. And let's let, let you tell the story of Nick from... Nick had multiple life sentences. Yeah. Nick is from F Philadelphia, uh, and he had uh, multiple life sentences. Go ahead, Paul. He had tell multiple I life sentences. He had... He was sentenced on life where he should have only got a maximum penalty of five years. Another one was a life sentence with uh, 20 years. He had a maximum penalty of 20 years. So, and probably 2000, I filed in, or 2004, I filed. Now, we're doing this from prison to prison. We all knew how to contact each other through mm -hmm. friends and family on the outside so we could stay in touch with each other, even when we went to other prisons. That's how we did it. But we, we, filed on him and he had a judge out of um, Philly that was just terrible. He, the, 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 I had Judge the, Giles out of Philly. That was Giles. That was a, that's who his Nick oh, had. Oh, you, you know what his name was? Hang him high Giles. Well, he hung Nicky high. I'm telling you, they called him Hang him high. He was a black judge. Never forget. I was lucky because I got four 12s run together. Mm -hmm. And because uh, I told him I'm going to trial in every freaking damn district. I, you know, I had the most most indictments in any prison because they had five different federal districts they indicted me in. Well, that's, <laughs> thank God for Rule 20, buddy. Rule 20 is when they take cases and they bring them all together in one district. Uh -huh. Anyway, tell keep keep going with the so Nick story. So with Nick, we we got his uh, the judge he screwed us and the, back then, and he turned around he he, tra he changed the petition that we filed to a. Uh, just a motion to collect uh, correct clerical errors, yeah. which is bullshit, yeah, yeah, I know right? One. So he just circumvented everything. He changed the things, and he still kept him with the life sentence, and that was it. And, you know, we appealed it. We went to the Supreme Court. We did everything we could. We lost it all. And then about two weeks ago, 
I said, Nikki. Well, wait, wait. First, you got him down from multiple lives to 25. No, he had. He still had lives. He still had two life sentences, and he had a bunch of 20s and all that shit. But that, all those sentences are dead. They're all, con, you know. Yeah, yeah. They finished them all. So he stuck with the life sentence, and and Nick went in when I went in. Yeah. When he when he uh, 20 years ago. Yeah. yeah when, when 24, I think. Right, 24 years? Whatever, yeah. I, two, yeah, I went so in in 96, yeah, 24 years ago. 24 years ago. So what we did was I filed a motion for him under the First Step Act that Trump enacted. The only judicial reform in, in the last 30 years came from him. You know, uh, if people think, these people talk bullshit about criminal justice reform, all of them. In fact, I, I got to give Trump this. He's the first one who's done anything. Let me say later. He's the first one to do anything for criminal justice reform. Yeah, in 30 years. 30 years. And every one of these presidents had an opportunity, because we all know the war on drugs was a, the biggest bullshit fucking thing that you can think of. Well, what they did was they just, they went from no rehabilitation whatsoever to warehousing people. But getting back to Nick, we filed the petition for him on about two weeks ago. On the seventh, the government joined our petition for what? Well, you got to tell to, what? For, to, to get him time served, to okay, get him out under what? Uh, under a, compassion? The, a compassionate release. I what I did was I, I put them all together: the compassionate release, the Cares Act, and and the First Step Act, because he had been enhanced for 851, and now been, again. Had he been sentenced? Tell him what an 851 is. A 851 is a notice of enhancement that the government files. It's an aggravating factor, and they say that you would have uh, two prior convictions. So now, with one prior conviction, your mandatory minimum goes to from 10 to 20, and then with two, it goes from 20 to life. 20 to life. I mean, it goes to life. You get it? You yeah, because you have three right. strikes out. You know. So they did that with him, and they gave it to him. But when we filed the motion, I said, listen, bro, we have nothing to lose and everything to gain. And, and it was, I really worked hard putting it together. And in the meantime, after all these years, even since I've been out, we've been trying to help Nick even get a, he's Greek. And we tried to even get him a, 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 a release, treaty transfer. a treaty transfer, they call it, to Greece. They, they hung it up. up, then they hung that one up. Yeah. That expired. He couldn't do that one again. Yeah, put and him in for two pardons. He couldn't get it. He was in. He's still in right now for a pardon, but he's he's coming home. You know. He's, the, he's, the, the bottom line. Go ahead. Tell bottom him. line is he's he's we we got the, the they granted it. They granted the motion and they gave him time served, and then they left a little window in there for the 14 days of uh, being in um, quarantine. He's the head orderly. He's the uh, the orderly that's in charge of all the other orderlies that are on a COVID-19 task force. So they use the inmates to clean up everything. So he's a first responder in prison, right? And that's how I wrote it up for him. He's a first responder. <laughs> he does all this stuff. Talk about creative writer. And and he he is the judge granted it in seven days. The prosecutor adopted it and granted the motion in seven days days. Paul, he got the prosecutor to go along and what they call attach to the motion. And once they do that, it's really judges very rarely go against both of them because there's no yeah. there's no fight. There's, there's no argument. There's, I mean, the guy's been down 24 years. And we're know. not talking murderers. No. He didn't do any murders, guys. So I look at that and I, I always say, what, what a vicious criminal justice system the United States has. And you know I talk about this a lot. Here they got a guy, didn't kill anybody, he was a drug dealer, you know, typical like most guys in the joint who get mega time. Well, what was, what was, what got him back involved, because he had two prior drug convictions, but what got him back involved was he, he had a son, a special needs kid that was born, and we don't know about these programs and stuff that might exist for it. So he just jumped back in the drug business to pay for his child's education and treatment and all that stuff. And you know, it was a, it was I, I, I would say it was a very um, noble thing for a father to do for his child, you know, to because he really was yeah. trying to help him. And they turned around and he got pinched. He went to jail. He, I mean, 
He manned right up. He said, listen, it's me. He told all his co-defendants, tell on me, get a reduction. I remember I that. I, re I used to talk to Nick yeah. about it. He fought his case for a few years, actually, before getting going to the big house, we called it. He, I was with Nick in uh, uh, School Kill, Pennsylvania, and Fairless Hills, I think yep. it was, and the county jail. I was with Nick for all, in all the places because for a year we were together, and I told you he, did my, he was my chiropractor. Yeah, he was everybody's chiropractor. <laughs> <laughs> fucking crazy we think about that everybody's kind of right but anyway good. so paulie just to let everybody know and i'm putting this stuff up here right now this is what paulie does the best i've ever seen i don't ever say this you notice know on my channel i don't promote stuff i do my commercials when manscaped and all that kind of stuff come but paulie's by far the best litter uh post-conviction relief person i've ever seen in prison i worked diligently i got my paralegal and i would bounce it off paulie I was a good writer, and I would get fight the system very hard, just like Paulie did. And at this point, Paulie now is still to this day saving lives every day. Well, you know, I was blessed with uh, with the ability to do it. I as it's like, you know, who knew that you could have the ability to absorb the law the, the way that we did? You know oh. what I mean? It's, we used to work in a law library, and we used to. Do nothing but law work. I'm gonna All give you a time. funny story. Books. Oof. You know, in the court system, people don't know this. They have to accept any writ or uh, a motion you put in. They have to do it. And the prison system is supposed to give you whatever needs you are to put that in. Well, one prison Paul was at didn't <laughs> want to do that. <laughs> Tell them that story, Paul. Oh, they. I asked them. They had. They took me up to Boston for a probation violation. I just got 360 months. And, 360 and, months, you know what that is? Add it up. And they, they turned around and they said, okay, 30 years. we want to <laughs> give you, I, I said, listen, I'm pro se, I need, a, I need access pro to the law library. Pro se you fight for oneself. Right, so I said, I have, to, I have to have access to the law library. And the guy says, uh, okay, well here's the law library. They had like six books. <laughs> and I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> This ain't a law library. Well, that's all we have. I said, okay, well, give me a typewriter. I We don't have no typewriters. I said, really? This back when we had typewriters, young guys. Yeah. No computers. This is typewriters. That was a big deal. That was a very big deal. Well, they gave me a typewriter. First, I had a right to the court. So what I did was I had uh, Meaty, actually. Oh, he, my God. Meaty, yeah. Meaty, Meaty is an my, outlaw. Yeah, he, he was my co-defendant's uh, nephew. So he turned around and I, he, he was, you know, bringing me stuff in the jail because I'm locked up in the county jail. And he says, uh, I said, listen, I have to write this thing. They won't give me no paper. They won't give me nothing. So I wrote it on a toilet paper. I wrote a motion. Think what he said. This paper. is in the law books now. I, I wrote it on toilet paper and I put a little tape on the pencil on the bottom and a pencil on the top and I scrolled it down <laughs> and then I had I had Meaty he was in there running the little county jail and shit so he had a connection he gave it to the cops so that they would mail it out obviously because if they feel something in there they're not letting nothing go so he got one cop to mail it for me right and like three days later the the uh, sheriff comes down to my cell and he says uh, you fucking filed a motion about me uh, on a thing? I said, listen, you, you're, you don't have anything for us to fight a case with. I said, you don't have no law library. I can't get a typewriter. Oh, I'm going to give you a typewriter, he says, right? I, I said, you know, I need paper. I need pencil. I need everything I need. He says, uh, well, if you didn't send the two papers to the court stuck to your little toilet paper roll motion, then you'd have pencils. I said, well, I need more pencils. And he says, well, the court contacted us and we're gonna give you the typewriter. <laughs> he brought me a fucking typewriter that was from like, I don't even know, it weighed about 40 pounds, right? <laughs> and all and, and it, you would break your finger trying to do it. <laughs> so the first thing I do, I think, oh good, I, I'm all set here. And I hit the first key and the ribbon had a black and red ribbon. The ribbon snapped. It turned to dust. Pow. Literally. Literally. And I'm like, motherfucker, you got to be kidding me. Now I have to fight with them to give me a ribbon. But in the meantime, I end up going to, to court. I get a probation office. 
he's up there trying to get me a consecutive sentence and the judge says you got to be kidding me why is he in my he says how much time do you have and i told him what i was doing and and the judge says and he looked at the probation officer he says you don't feel that he has enough on his plate right now you want to give him five years extra and and you already got 30 years so he tells me the judge looked at him and he said listen to me this case is dismissed Mr. Tallini, we're glad. I'm glad you have, because I had a sense of humor, you know, like really. And uh, he gives me, he gives me that he dismisses the probation violation. Bang, gone. I said okay, and he told the probation officer and them. He says, and don't appeal my opinion. Don't don't even think about trying to appeal this. He told them that. He told them that. He says, you know, the guy's already got enough on his plate. And I'm a young kid then. I'm still, you know, relatively young, 33 or whatever. And uh, I still had a lot of uh, uh, wildness in me, you know. Oh, we're going to talk about some of that. Uh, so yeah. going to the law, you know, Paulie and I used to, you know, again, when you do a lot of time like we did, you got to come up with ways to pass the time, to connect with family, to do. And we seen the young, Paulie and I were the two guys that used to see young people come to prison and say, what's wrong with these kids? First of all, they all come like they think they're tough guys. Yeah. What happens then, Paulie? They end up not being so tough. Either they, being they somebody's up, bitch. Yeah, <laughs> they, they, they learn pretty quickly, you know, but it's not a nice nice lesson that they're learning. You know what I mean? Some of them, you know, we, we've seen bad shit, you know what I mean? Look at the kid uh, in Edgefield with us, right? In Edgefield. Uh, what was that kid's name? In Edgefield, he got killed in front of, my, in front of our unit. The black kid killed him. He would, the uh, other kid, how many kids they, we see oh, get killed? A lot. But th- this kid got get this kid. He was from D.C. He was a nut. Well, mm-hmm. uh, what happened in Edgefield is they closed the law law in prison. prison. They yeah. called it. It's a, it's a federal prison. What people don't know, Washington D.C. is literally a federal area. Mm-hmm. The whole area is federal, so they don't go to a county jail, or they go to a city jail, or they don't go to a state jail. They come to the feds, and some of those D.C. kids they had shitty crimes. Most of the feds, we had big time guys like myself or Paulie. I mean, we were criminals. I hate to say it, what it was. We were criminals. Uh, we used to get these punk crackheads and, and, and crap oh, from terrible. Lawton. So they bust. How many buses did they do at that time? Riots. I, Everything I was going on the street. They, they, remember they the riots? Listen, we they, said, they, oh, they was my all God. all crazy stuff. But what, they, what they'd done is they, in the, when I went into the federal system, there were 42 prisons and 46,000 inmates. When now I, when I come home, there were 126 prisons, I believe, 100 and 200 and something thousand inmates. inmates. Yeah, it, it's nothing but a, a, a sad system, and I, I I preach against us worst prison. And you guys know I'm going to be coming up with uh, comparing country prisons, which that a lot of people have been asking for. But these DC prisoners come in; it, it was a shit show. So we have what they call lockdowns, or even unit lockdowns mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And we, we used to pass the time in some crazy ways. Paul, we, Paulie and I have been through the prison system when we had stuff like what's going on now. We had MRSA. Oh, fuck. Do you remember MRSA? MRSA, MRSA. remember what I did with that MRSA? Tell oh, me, my God. Th- this makes you laugh because he had the guards freaking out. Hey, <laughs> I had a woman, what was her name? Raleigh James. She was a talk show uh, host that I used to listen to on AM radio. Wait, wait. And we're going to get into... Art Bell and uh, George Norrie. Well, they were beautiful. They were like my... They were, the, they were a show that started at 12 at night, mm-hmm. and it ended like at 4 in the morning. Now, a lot of the inmates would literally... We used to get a transistor radio. Literally a transistor radio. And you only get a few channels. Unless, like, when I was in Atlanta, you got better because you were in the city area. Mm-hmm. Well, in Edgefield, you had a couple of channels, but they had Art Bell. Art I think it was Bell Art was Bell. Great. And their conspiracy. They're talking about the world ending. Tell them about that. The, the 13th planet. <laughs> right. <laughs> it was coming hey, around hey. the sun. And I told everybody, I said, wow, did you hear <laughs> uh, what's going on? And, 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 and we're, we're fucked. We're going to get fucking smashed with a, a thing and we don't have to worry. The world's ending. The world's ending. And so I'm repeating what Art Bell's discussing. And I, and I got everybody <laughs> listening. So they turn around and you I remember Paulie's like very well respected, but he used to. We used, I used to call him. I used to go up and tell him, "Say, Paulie, well, go ahead." That, they 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 went to the, they so many t- guys 
were crazy over what I was saying, they actually went to the psychologist <laughs> and they told the psychologist that, man, the world's ending, you know, we're going to get hit with a meteor, there's another planet going to crash into the planet. And the psychologist says, well, who told you this? And, and they all said, Talini. <laughs> You know, they're telling on me all, without a hesitation, but I'm telling on me. I'm glad oh. they weren't my co defendants. But they, they go to the uh, the psychologist. So we're coming, me, Larry and I are coming out of the, the hall, the, the dining hall. And I have a, a um, tomato. And this rookie cop is trying to take my tomato. But we're allowed one piece of fruit. And I told him, well, I have a piece of fruit. And he, and he says, that's not, a, that's not a piece of fruit. That's a vegetable. I said, listen, dude, it's a fucking piece of fruit. I remember that. And it's I, a fruit, I but, said, you know. I said, look it up. And the psychologist, he's like at the end of the, the staff line, and he's watching me. And I noticed that he's staring at me. So he, he comes up when we pass him by, and he says, come here, let me ask you a question. <laughs> What's going on with the fucking 13th planet? I said, wow, you heard about that? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, no, but you better stop telling everybody about it because they're coming to me. They want to kill themselves. They want to do all this stuff. One dude in the unit, and I will, I'll never forget this, he comes and he starts giving his stuff away. Uh, now, when you're in prison, your, your bowl, your cup, your sneakers, your shorts, mm -hmm. your, your stuff you buy off the commissary mm -hmm. is a big deal. It's really a big deal. You own it. <laughs> so one guy comes, he goes, Lord, do you need anything? I go, what are you talking about? He says, you want my cup? I go, what are you talking about? He goes, yeah, I'm giving all my stuff away. Paul, he said, the world's coming with him. <laughs> I'm fucking rolling, <laughs> pissing in my pants. <coughs> I, now, I lived on the bottom floor, and Paul was on the second tier. And I ended up walking up to his cell, and we used to hang out all together. And I'm laughing. I said, Paul, you got these fucking people all fucking nuts. They, they're giving their shit away. Now, these guys don't have anything. It's not like, oh, you know, you got, like, you can go buy this, or you can do this, yeah. go to this. That's a big deal, you know. You can only spend so much money on your commissary. You can spend that. And Paulie's got them giving their shit away. That's how crazy the people were in this prison. And then we ha he had a celly. He had a celly. We used to call him Flipper. Aye, right, Flipper now, was beautiful. listen, it's a sad case to begin with. First of all, the guy couldn't read. When I say couldn't read, first of all, let me let you know. 20% of an inmate population is illiterate, yeah. totally illiterate. That means they're functionally illiterates. Well, this guy couldn't read the word the, and he used to get letters, and Paulie used to read to him. I mean, read his letters yeah, and help him write. Him and try to teach he, him. This guy was the funniest dude in the world. Mm -hmm. He had him so fucked up in his prison. I'm like, come on, Paulie. And we did this to what? Tell a couple of stories about fucking Flipper. Oh, Flipper was beautiful. He was a, he was a uh, method. Wasn't he Not from Tennessee? That. He was a huffer. Oh. <laughs> he was, a huffer. He was he, from Tennessee. He was from Saudi Daisy, Tennessee. <laughs> I said, what the fuck is Saudi Daisy, Tennessee? <laughs> I never heard of this place. But Flipper was from Saudi Daisy. And, it, you know, he was a good kid. He had a, a real good heart. A little tank. Yeah, yeah, know? yeah. A yeah. little, little and, bowling and ball. And he, uh, he, you know, he, he just said he'd come up rough, you know, and whatever happened yeah, to him when he was young and the poverty and everything that he was there, he, he, he ended up sniffing paint. That was a huffer, he was a huffer. He was to pour the paint in the, the bag, spray the paint in and then smell, smell it. Is that, that the, yeah, that's what he did. That's what he did. And that, he fucked his brain you know, up. If, if anybody's listening, don't try that shit. Cause that's yeah, not guys, fun. come on, that shit will, that shit guy, will fry your brain. It, he, his fucking brain was fried. But he was a real good kid. And he he was clean, you know what I mean. He he you because roommates now, are very very you know what hard people don't find. know in the prisons we were in, high security. You get to pick your celly pretty much. Yeah, they ain't fucking around with us. It's not like a camp or a thing. You go here, you go there. Nah, you ain't doing mm -hmm. that to guys like us. So what happened was you pick your celly. It's very important. You get to know somebody a little bit. They see him walking around. Is he a snitch? Is he a chomo? Or they don't last, but. You know, whatever. He's not the right kind of guy, like Paulie said. You look for a clean guy who's respectful. Mm -hmm. When I say respectful, you take a piss in that fucking toilet. You better clean that freaking bowl, because I use that shit, too. Exactly. And he got himself a clean celly. And yeah, that, that don't. I mean, he, he, was, he was a real good kid, you know. 
and he used to do my laundry. He would pick the <laughs> he house. Fucking. He cleaned the house. He fucking, uh, you know, I helped him with his case. I tried to get him some relief because they just gave they gave him a crazy ass thing. The guy, he was a nonsense nuisance. Yeah, he it was, was a, a nuisance. He did it. First of all, we I, I remember talking about this, Paul. He didn't belong in federal prison. No. You know, like no. I said, a lot of the guys Paulie and I dealt with were, listen, kingpins, mafia bosses, uh, guys like us who were either big time jewel robbers or uh, arm robbers, or I was Rico with the Hobbs Act. Paulie was a mega drug dealer. We had a lot of that. And when you see kids in there that didn't really belong, and I say didn't no, belong it's, by it's sad that that, that the what system. they do to them, they they you to know to get a conviction, just to get a conviction. They didn't care about anything else. That's why, like today, what I do is uh, I, I'm, I'm doing a lot of uh, pre-trial consultation because it's easier to set the tone than it is to unring the bell. What Paulie's saying, uh, I'll give you guys a little hint. What he does, I, I, I mentioned it briefly, but he's going to get into it. Just like me, when I help people with the reality check program, I, I try to prevent them from going in the first place. Yeah. Paulie's did the same thing. A guy gets, let's just say a kid gets uh, caught, I don't care if it's a bank robbery or he gets caught with drugs, because what people don't get, if you get caught with 500 grams of cocaine, that's 10 to life. Mm. 500 grams, it's not a lot, that's a half a key. A key is 1,000 grams. Half a key, you're going for 10 to life. And if you got over a key, 20 to life. You, you, you can, it depends on the statues that they're, you're up under. But what they'll do is they always seek the, the stiffest penalty possible. And they'll utilize anything. They'll, 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 they'll use misdemeanors now to enhance you and give you more points. And, and that, that'll set your guideline range level. They can shoot that sucker up way high. And you have to, what I do is I identify mitigating factors. Like if I, Flipper had a, an IQ. Oh, I think it was, was under like, 60. It was under 60. Which, it was, which it was, is it was technically like 50, retarded. 58. Yeah. He uh, was a borderline uh, retarded person, right? I don't and, know if that's the right word. A well, slow adult or whatever. It is. Eh, whatever it is. Well, you know, politically correctness or whatever. <laughs> you know, the fact is the guy couldn't function. In, except for in his little neighborhood. You know what I mean? He would function very well doing whatever it was he was doing. Yeah. But he was, uh, you know, he was certified, a certified nut job. And he was, he, he just, I don't think he ever had an opportunity in his life, for real. Right. You know what I mean? And like I said, he was a nonsense thief. He used to walk down the street and he'd be high on that paint and, and he'd see a gun in a, somebody's rack of their car and he'd steal the, the gun. Yeah, he was a petty criminal. He was a he was petty a... criminal, and and he had a lot of them. He had, like, a lot of uh, prior uh, convictions. Probably, yeah. Well, again, but why do you bring a kid like that into the Fed system and not try to help him? You, like he said, because he was a slow adult. I lo I remember Flipper so well, and I used to, because I used to go to Paulie's cell. Well, another great story, you know, Paulie and I, we sit, we could sit and talk for hours. One of the talk we talk about, we were on the yard, and do you remember when the old Georgie hit the guy with a... Uh, oh, what did Jesus. He... <laughs> now, these are two geriatric. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he says... Now, Paul, he's an, uh, Georgie's another one who's borderline. I don't think he's... Uh... No, he was, he was back then, but he educated himself. He learned how to read. He learned how to write. He right, wrote right. books. He wrote... Him right. He, oh, no, no, yeah. Doing a great, he's doing great right now. He, he, was in, he got a life... And did 32 years in prison for marijuana. You hear that, everybody? 32 years for marijuana. Do you uh, do you know what he does today? No, what it is? What is he today? owns the Hip Hamp Cafe in Philadelphia, and he's in the marijuana business. Are you kidding? Illegally, hemp. You know, he, yeah. he's doing the hemp pot. Whatever. He's not in doing the whatever the, the, THC, the, the THC, THC level. You know, that is so but funny. But that is fucking how crazy this country is. This guy did 32 years of prison, 32 the years longest, of his life. The longest serving nonviolent marijuana at the time defendant. And there's other ones. I have other ones well, yeah, that I'm, I'm, I'm say, trying yeah. to work with now, but you know, they're, they've been down so long and so many disappointments, it's, it's hard to get them to, to try to understand. And I don't blame them because you get frustrated and you know, you just give up. 
people, that's what the, a lot you know, of what, do. What, what, what Paulie up. and I talk about a lot, everybody, is how the system beats you down. And, you know, it, Paulie and I happen to be success stories, but so many aren't. You no. know, they come out, they're lost, they don't have family, they don't have the brain power, I hate to say that, to really make it. Some do, again, but a big percentage, Paulie, are, no, are like just... No, a percent of them don't. And, 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 the, and the system don't help. No, it doesn't You know, help. they say, oh, we, we're going to, you know, we give you a uh, pre-release program. Jerk me off with your pre-release uh, program. They do nothing for you except say you went through a program. Yeah. And, Paulie, you do know I'm the only inmate to go back into the prison he was in. That was like the greatest fucking day when I heard that. I was like, <laughs> you heard that? How did you hear I that? Got, I, got, I heard about that. Were you in? No. I heard, you out? I, I was out. I heard about that when I was in Columbia, and I was still working, doing my law, my work. law work for guys here. He still does. <laughs> and I, I, I was doing that, and I got a letter from... Carlos Pagan, yeah, right, yeah. the big, yeah, yeah, uh, big Puerto, Puerto Rican. Rican, and he says, "Hey, Uncle Paulie, Larry was just here," <laughs> and he, I said, "What do you mean? He's in jail?" <laughs> you know I mean? I'm, e I'm emailing. I said, "What are you kidding me? He's in jail?" And 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 he sends me back another email, and he says, "No, he came and he spoke. Man, I was so happy to see him, and what a fucking great guy!" And he got to walk out the door. He said, and I, everybody was just, they couldn't believe that they actually let him back into the prison to speak to these guys about what's coming what, out. What's about coming out. out. You know, I went, uh, to let everybody know, I went back into Coleman. I was in Coleman, and I ended up going back into Coleman to speak at their, uh, what a... That's a pre-release pre program. Pre-release program. And I, I get up, and I talk, and they tell me I can't do this, I can't do this. This is what's funny. I had my business cards with me. They didn't search me. It was crazy. I mean, I went right to the warden's office. They walked me. When I walked in, they walked. And you know what the feeling was going back into a prison? First oh, of all, it's like, holy shit. And then I'm going to the warden's office. I'm, you know, you always have that. To this day, when I see a cop, it gives you the chills. You know that. It's mm -hmm. just something that's in us. And they bring me to the warden's office. He sit down. Sit down. Hey, you're doing great stuff. You're doing this. And, and now I'm like, I'm a big shot. I'm what? Now, you know. They have in prison, they have movements, which you don't just get to walk around like any, like we are today. You can't just walk around in a prison. No. You have you to, what they call minutes. a 10 minute yeah. move. You got to go on the top of the hour, two o'clock, they'll scream, 10 minute move, 10 minute move. You got 10 minutes to get to where you're going and then they lock you down wherever you're at. Mm -hmm. Well, here I am in the middle of the yard, walking down with the war and like I'm a big shot. You know, I'm laughing inside. I'm like, holy shit, believe this fucking shit. I walk in. And of course I'm there, and I see people I actually know. I mean that—that's, I mean how ironic it was. So afterwards, they, the warden leaves, and I'm end up talking. I—I I, I had a, a guard and a counselor, who were my escorts. Do whatever, like I was the boss. Mm -hmm. And it, it's like so funny. So I'm in between the units, you know the way they have them. And the counselor goes, I gotta make some calls. The guard's sitting there. I'm talking, everybody's coming up to me. I'm giving them cards. <laughs> they talk, I'm giving them cards, I'm doing everything. But I'm telling people, listen, you gotta get out. You gotta make it, you know? You, you know you know why that is good to do, that, that they, they allowed you to do that? Is because, for real, you know, we're powerful examples of change. Yeah. And we can show because people know how we acted in there and what we did in there, you know. And and you know, he was he was more of an administrative fighter. He would fight against anything. And I was more of a guy who was trying to fight for the freedom, people's freedom. And I know? was fighting the uh, the system, the policies, the whole violations. Yeah. Uh, all the I was <laughs> Do you remember when I wrote the article? When uh, when uh, uh, Abu Guy Abu what was that Abu, Abu Garab Abu, 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 Abu Garab, <laughs> boy they, they fucked me over for that one. But the do you remember when uh, Ar uh, Arch died? Yeah, yeah. A good friend of ours, God dies, comes walking off the off out of the medical department. That's three days after complaining. He complained. Three days. For three that days. day he walked to his own. No, but he had been complaining been for three like days. A week it was actually. It was a week. It was a week. Mm -hmm. And his guy who works for CMS sends him back to the medical and says, man, you look terrible, man. Get, get to medical. They send him and said, hey, you got gas. Yeah, they gave him Pepto-Bismol. They gave him Pepto-Bismol. Pepto he walks into the unit. He grabs Jimmy Brown. I'll never forget it. Mm -hmm. And he says, 
Jimmy, I'm dying. We put him in a chair. He keels over. And we're trying to go. And the guard's screaming, lockdown, lockdown. Puts us in there. And then they come in every one of ourselves and says, you see him hit his head, right? I know he didn't hit his head. Fuck you, he hit his head. I off to the hole, I go. And they tried to shut me up, and that was one of probably the worst thing they could have did because well, I would have quit. Well, that just got you to fight more. And, and, and you know, the, the letter campaign, like, I just, I just, there's a lot of stuff going on, like, in different prisons in the country. And I'm on these little prison sites, and people contact me on Facebook. And they ask me for advice on, you know, what can I do? My husband is here, and this is what's going on in this prison. And... And I tell them, listen, forget about the administrative remedy. Right. That's what administrative remedy is what they call a BP-8, BP-9, BP-10. And it's all nothing but a delay tactic. It's a delay tactic. can take you nine months to exhaust your remedy. And then you can go to court. I said, here's what you do. Find out who your senator is and write him. We wrote Lindsey Graham. Uh, not only Lindsey Graham, at the time, Senator Clinton... Graham, oh, yeah. Congressman McCollum, uh, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, the Attorney General. I sued the Attorney General, mm -hmm. uh, Albert Gonzalez. Yeah, back then. You, hey, do you remember when I got... He's a judge now, right? No, is he? I think so. Oh, you I think he you remember when, when they threw me in a hole for jacking off of myself? Yeah. And I sued them? Yeah. And I won? I, I didn't win. They transferred me, but do you know the policy changed? They don't. They don't uh, well, they, lock you up anymore for that. Well, they they shouldn't. Be, of I mean, course, you know, uh, who doesn't wrong? do what that? What are you gonna do? You, you know? know, they want you to fuck somebody or what? Or do they want you, you know. to just relieve yourself? I had a doctor write a note. I don't know if you know this, saying it was healthy for a person after forty to masturbate for a healthy prostate. Well, fuck! I don't know what happened with me. My <laughs> prostate ain't healthy. <laughs> <laughs> and you did a lot of that. <laughs> <laughs> So Paulie and I would fight the system. We would sit literally and, and, and work law books. Wow. And we would bounce stuff off each other. Hey, how does this sound? You know, because everybody doesn't understand in whatever you do. I tried, and Paulie, I give him a lot of credit. He was a lot smarter than me, a little older than me, a lot smarter than me. I started first being the, the crazy person, the violent person, the fight them. I can, can't win. Can't win. No, once I learned, a, they have a bed for you. <laughs> once I learned to use the pen, that's when the power came out. The power came out because I wrote and sued and wrote, and they couldn't stop me. I just mm -hmm. was that relentless person and got change. And you know, I look back at that now, Paulie. And to be honest, I think it helped me as much as it helped the, the system. Oh, sure. It, it kept me have a mission. Because anybody, Paulie's done years two in a hole. I did three years in a hole, and uh, eleven I? straight months. Paulie did years in a hole as well, and we both been on Conair. I've been on Conair sixteen times. I think it was sixteen I counted. Yeah, I don't and even remember. Through through Atlanta, uh, all the play. I was in Atlanta. I was actually when I went through Atlanta once. They put me in Atlanta hole instead of the the the, uh, the, the holdover hole. They put mm. me in Atlanta hole. Totally legal. I mean, taking any inmate there, putting them in the penitentiary hole. Yeah, they did it to me. Well, they did. They did a lot of things. Look at what they did with Georgie Mo. They did, they stuck his ass in Marion, his Is first it, stop. Are you kidding me? Is he that went to Marion with he the was, life sentence from pot in Marion. He Marion was, in was Marion like was at that the, time. It was before ADX. Yeah. They didn't have Colorado, which is the, mm. the number one prison. And if you go online, if you look at ADX Colorado, you'll see it's the, the worst prison in the United States, bar none. Forget states. I think second is state might be Pelican Bay, California, I think Attica. But ADX and the feds. I, I used to get a kick out of people, Paulie. You know, you, you did state time at Wapaw. Well, and, uh, and, and they and they, <laughs> and they tell people, Oh, you know, I'd rather be in the in the Fed than the state. They have no idea what's hitting to them when they go to a maximum security federal prison. Because you got nothing coming. They don't no. give a fuck who you know, who you are, how much money you got. In the state, you know somebody's brother in law, you know somebody there, something happens. Yeah, you feds, can make moves. You can't make them in the feds. Feds do not feds care. are not doing nothing like that. What they'll do is you know, if you want to tell on your mother and your father and everybody that you ever knew and had dinner with, then they'll give you anything you want, you know. And they still screw them. 
And I would just you know. say, you know, Paulie and I were known as what they call in the system as stand-up guys. Uh, we did our time. We, we fought the system. We didn't rat. We didn't do the shit that so many people do. And, you know, it took me many, many years to get over it. Where I, I don't give a fuck what they do. I mean, yeah. I, you know, I'm paying. You remember in this joint? Forget it. If we found out he was <laughs> a rat, he was done. They weren't even on the compound anymore. No. We, they, it, be, would be, it would be. Uh, they would either get fucked up and run to the hole. And yes. get transferred. They would usually do that. <laughs> but my, my, what I was getting at is, is, you know how we were about that. How neg, you know. Now I don't give a fuck. I, yeah. I don't mean I don't. I don't like it. I think a word, person's I, word I means think something. That, I think that you know you come into this world with your balls and your fucking word, and if you break either one of them, you got nothing. Not even a man. Wow, that's a good way. I never said you that. Know? That's a great way to say it. Paulie made. To, I also also say, you know, we faced what I used to call we we faced the devil. We were facing mega time, and we didn't rat. You know, you get guys. I don't care how tough they think they are. Once they hear that word, thirty years life. I was facing life, and I beat my nine twenty four C. Matter of fact, another case we did was my own brother. Yeah, and we got yeah. him back in court, except for another jerk off lawyer who but didn't know shit. That happens all the time. And, and, and guys like us who study, when I say study the law, there's no lawyer out there who could say they studied the law more than Paulie, no. or myself even. And, and Paulie's and got double was, my time. That was with the, that was when we had books. <laughs> you that remember what books. we used to do? We'd be in a law library shepherdizing, uh, and now and it's... Doing everything. Now you have a computer. I love this. Yeah. <laughs> this, yeah, I could be sitting on a boat in the middle of the ocean. As long as I got Wi-Fi, I'm, I'm hooked in. You know what I mean? And I can find shit out like this i couldn't make a phone call when i came home you remember yeah remember uh, I was, I, yeah he gave me he gave me my first phone he gave me my flip phone that he had when when i was on the bus he was on the bus the one he the was razor flip thing phone with his little his little radio he used to hide it in yeah, exactly right and, and uh yeah he gave me that phone while i was in the halfway house you know uh, he probably got yeah. out what out of a three well it was, what was it? What, when did you get out? 14? 6 to 14 now. Six I years. got out. A year I, and a half with health. I got out in 07. And so I'm out already. I'm established. And when I got out, you couldn't even have a, a cell phone in a halfway house. Yeah. Ridiculous. I mean, uh, you want to try to adapt the person to society. Cell phones were just starting to blow up. And they're trying to adapt the person to society and not giving them a phone. I mean, I, uh, why? Well, why are you holding people back so much? Well, when Paulie got out, he was allowed to have a phone. I remember that. It, it couldn't be a... Yeah, I had you on my account could, and everything. Yeah, it couldn't be an iPhone. It right. had to be a flip phone. Yeah, it couldn't be a smartphone. You smartphone, yeah. It couldn't be a smartphone. And I ended up keep putting them on my account because I know how it is when you get out. Anybody tells you, oh, I'm all right. You Nobody's all right when they get out. No. I don't care who you are, where you've been. If you did time like we did, you're not all right, you know? And it's sad because our system doesn't try to help people. No. they. I tried to take computer classes. They told me I had too much time. I tried to do things. But they were teaching you, like, uh, you know, nothing. I, what was that? Um, I forget the programs. But it was like a, a, it was like writing code type program. Yeah, yeah, okay. And, and I'm like, okay, I'll try to learn that. And I tried to learn it, but I, I wasn't learning nothing. They wouldn't let me in the class. <laughs> and, and then I, I they knew you know, run the I just class. yeah I just did my thing I mean I was blessed you know in in '89 when I was first arrested my wife told me she we were interviewing lawyers and they wanted tennis bracelets so, do you have a Mercedes do you have this do you have that oh they and all want the money they wanted the money they didn't care they were looking for gifts for their fucking wives and I'm like and my wife is listening and she's like what are you kidding me and she said honey listen to me. If you do not study this law and understand it, you're really going to be in trouble because no one's going to help you. You well, got to help yourself. So she got me a course from a friend of hers. Said, "Listen, here's the course. It's called um, same the, as mine, Blackstone." The, no, I Black, got Blackstone. Black, you you did Blackstone. I did. Um, Jesus, I can't even remember. That's how I got my paralegal degree. You remember when I got it? Do you remember when I got I knew it? We were in a hole. Uh, yep, yeah, I was in the hole. <laughs> Uh, my cousin, God bless us to this day, I love I love my cousin. She saved my life on the bus. But my cousin bought me a course called uh, Blackstone Paralegal. And I ended up getting my, I remember going through all those books. You remember that and you'd help me. 
I mean, I used to go up to him, and I got my stuff back in the mail, and you had a proctor and all that. Yeah. I used to go to Paul. Hey, look at this. I ended up with a 96-point-something. I'll never forget. You did better than me. <laughs> I just thought. You did better. I think I had an 88. But what I talk about with that, Paul, is same with Larry, me. I wouldn't be out if I didn't study the gun charges. I knew the gun charges, the 924C, better than any man, because mm -hmm. I dove every case you can even read about. A 924C is a gun charge under the federal. When we talk numbers, those are federal numbers, federal codes in the uh, criminal code of uh, yeah. uh, uh, the federal code. How do you how do you say it? Federal code of uh, criminal code of justice. Uh, no, not the criminal codes. Criminal codes, but federal criminal codes, whatever mm -hmm. it is. And then 920. You can go at any book or even now today, just write in federal code 924C. If you and just I, put in 924C, now it will come up. But it's 18 U.S.C. 18 U.S. 924C. And, United and States codes. Yeah, United States United code. United States code. And, and, and it's a code for a reason because it really is a code. You have to chase the statute to understand what it means. And you'll be chasing 924C and then you'll end up in uh, Title 52, uh, 51. You'll end up in Title 2. You'll end up in tax codes. You'll you know why they do that. Yeah. They make it so it's, it's, it's very hard for the layman to do his own legal work. Yeah. They make it so hard for a, a regular person to understand it even, and they made that on purpose so the lawyers can keep getting the money they get. And and once Paulie and I figured that out, and him well before me, and we started studying the law and studying the law, and I ended up going on to the CFR, which is Code of Federal Regulations, which is, again, fighting administration. The, more yeah. fighting the system, what they're allowed to do. I could tell you how in the whole they're supposed to pull you out every 30 days and interview psychologically because we know being in a hole is one of the worst things we can do to oh, a human being. Isolation is terrible. That's why today what these guys are doing, they're out three hours a week out of their cells, three hours a week. Now picture that, you're stuck in a room. Wait, 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 let, let's get real. Do you think they are out three hours a week? No, they come out three hours. Yeah, but how many times do they say, like they did when I was in five? Oh, oh uh, dude, we, what's the great word they use in the Federal Bureau System? For the safe and orderly running of the institution, we had to cancel rec today. Right, because we're short on staff. Or whatever reason they used to mm. come up. They used to come up with reasons not to give you rec. I remember, and rec is in a 20 by 10 foot cage. They used to bring you out into this cage for an hour, literally a dog cage, mm -hmm. and they'd say they give you a rec. But they'd even take that away from I remember not getting rec for 14 straight days, never leaving mm -hmm. the cell. And every time you go, wreck, you bang on the door, wreck. Oh, no, no wreck today. Or the cop will come by and he'll, he'll just walk by your room. Walk by. He'll not even or, take you. Yeah, or he'll make believe that he wrote your number down. And then he'll say, you know, that morning shift would do it. The, e the yeah, evening yeah. shift. That's Before right. Before they left, they used to come and say, okay, you're going to go to wreck today? Yeah, put me on for the wreck. All right. And then the guy would be coming for wreck the next shift. And he'd say, well, you're not on the fucking list. You should have got up and fucking said, you know, yeah. you want a wreck. Oh, my God. And you'd be like, what are you talking about, dude? I, was, I told him I was on the thing. He's, I watched him sign me up. And, and you and want They'd even show you the list. Oh, it's not on here. Yeah, they'd have another one. Yeah. <laughs> and they'd say, well, you're not on here. So now you, you can't get what you go out. And, and Tell, the, I, I used to get a kick out of people. You know, Paul, it's funny because people used to come up to me and they, they can't do that to you. They can't do that to you. I used to say, let me tell you something. Can't do it to you. This country went to Panama. They took a president out and said he was a drug dealer. Whatever, right? Uh, Noriega. And they're not going to fuck with you? Yeah. Nor <laughs> Nor Nor Noriega. They you knew Noriega. Didn't you, did you yeah, meet him? He was in Miami with me. He was in Miami prison with Paul. He, Noriega used to see yeah. him walk the yard, right? He used to walk the compound. After everyone was locked down, he, he had his own apartment there. <laughs> yeah. you know. Talk about being a political prisoner. Yeah. You know, but he, uh, th at that time, I was studying the law. It was, um, you were in Miami. In Miami, yeah. Were you uh, ever in FDC, Miami? And the building downtown? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I was When I went back, I won uh, my, uh, my uh, 2255. And, and 2255 is the ineffective assistance of counsel. Right. You file that to say your lawyer was a moron, and most of the times they are. Paulie and I were great mm -hmm. at that, man. And we'd win the case and get back in court. So once you're back in court, they take you wherever you got to go. And then I was in I was in Seven East. I was on Eleven West. I was in Seven East. I was upstairs. On I the used penthouse. to look out the window. That window's this big, you know, like that long. 
that mm -hmm. wide. I used to look out and see the Miami Arena. Yeah. You're right right yeah. there is the Miami Arena downtown. But that 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 was a hell you, of an But experience. you were on the yard in Miami, weren't you? In, like they, now there was a prison. There was an actual prison in Miami. Yeah, that's what they used to have. That was a, uh, MDC, Miami. It's now, out, did they Southwest? Did they use that for holdover as well before the building before, was up? Before before the building was up, that's when they had that, and then after they built the building, then they put people. Then there. they put people. It's like there. they did with me with Fairless Hills yeah. and Schoolkill. Yeah, but yeah. they turned around and. The uh, when I was studying at Southern Career Institute, that's where I took my thing. It was a okay. four-year program, right? And that's what Yoli bought me. And I, I'm, I'm studying it, and I, I'm learning. I'm saying, well, well, fuck, I, they can't do this. They can't do that. You know, <laughs> this is not right. This is not right. You know. I love that. And I was right. Say, so 1996, I won my 2255. They bring me back for an evidentiary hearing after the second, uh, the first day of testimony and everything my co-defendant was written down and he's testifying on my behalf you know and his family's there his grandmother and everything when i left the the, the courthouse that day the prosecutor looked over jeff levinson he's a lawyer he's a judge now in florida and he turned around and he told the attorney he got this you so, mean you won it yeah he got this is what he said he got this so the lawyer comes to visit me about a week later. And he says, uh, they, because they continued the case. It was supposed to be the next day. They, they stopped that hearing and they continued the case for a week to give the attorney that I was going against an opportunity to study everybody else's testimony that had already testified on my behalf. So the lawyer comes and he says, uh, Talini, would you plead guilty? I said, fuck, no, I'm not pleading guilty. I'm innocent. I'm going to trial. I want another trial. Let's go. And, and he says, okay. Well, I get the hearing, and I'm back and waiting for the, for the judge, uh, Lorana Snow, to make her ruling, right? And Rhonda Anderson comes up to me, and she says, she's an attorney that I was working I with. I remember and that. Stuff. I remember and that. And she comes up to me, and she's pissed. She's really upset. And I says, what, what are you, why are you talking like, what are you, what's the matter? She says, you could be coming home today and you rejected an offer to plead guilty to time served? I said, what are you talking about? I didn't get no offer to plead guilty to time <laughs> You'd be served. out there. <laughs> it's in 1996. You were I, in already seven years. Yeah. I said, what are you, I said, what are you crazy? Of course I would plead guilty to time served. I'm going home. <laughs> And she said, well, I seen the prosecutor, and I asked him why he had such a hard on for you. And he said, what are you talking about? I told him if he pled fucking guilty, I'll let him out today. The lawyer never told me that part of it. He only asked me if I would plead guilty. Now, there's a big difference. Would you plead guilty and go home? Or would you plead guilty? And just maybe and get another, maybe get three, another few years fucking, on your sentence. Uh, yeah, you know. So I said, they ne he never told me that. I said, he, she said, really? He never told you that you could? I said, no, he never told what me. His name was Michael Smith. Who you think you're crazy? I, 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 uh, and I'll never forget him because he cost me another 23 years. 23 years. And I was like, what, are you fucking serious? You know? And, and he says, well, I, I, t I asked you if you would plead guilty and you told me no. I said, dude. Will you plead guilty to time served is a big difference. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and and uh, so I got banged in that, and, and I just went down the road. I was angry for a long time after because he did that, and I appealed it and tried all this stuff, and was everything yeah, was yeah. just denied because, I, you know, they're looking at me like I'm a, I'm a moron, and I could have went home, and I'm telling them, you know, fuck you. Yeah, I wouldn't do you that. Know. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. funny. You remind me about pleading guilty. Uh, if You might remember this. I ended up getting convicted in 2001, after I've been in since 96, for 18 U.S.C. 1001, which is filing <laughs> a false statement. And I got convicted of that, but I did not plead to it, or because they wanted me to plead guilty, because I said no, because if, if I plead guilty, you can then use that against my brother. Yeah. I said, but if I don't plead guilty, you can't use it, knowing the law. So I, I'm sitting there, I'll never forget this. I'm in Philadelphia, uh, 
they got me, and uh, my lawyer is saying, your public defender is with me, and he says, plead guilty, they're going to give you time served. I said, no, I can't plead guilty. And I know the charge carried, I think, 36 months tops, you know. And I said, nah, I can't do it. I said, because if my brother wins his appeal, they're going to use that. And then they'll he, use that against, against him. And their lawyers are so pissed off, boy. And I mean, I said, I'm not doing it. I'm going to trial. So then last minute, the lawyer comes up and says, listen, this is, they pull me out. And, you know, I'm, I'm in Philadelphia, in Sixth and Market. And they pulled me out. And he says, Law, he goes, if, if you plead guilty, don't, if you just plead to a bench trial, agree to a bench trial, agree not pull a, a jury, not pull a judge. jury, will recommend time run concurrent. I says, all right, they're going to recommend time run concurrent. I know what a judge can do. You know, he can tell that and take a hike with it. Mm-hmm. So here we are in the courtroom, and we put up my case. They put up their case, and they got a mountain of evidence, you know, looking for John Rodriguez. Of course, there's no John Rodriguez. <laughs> so, because that was my lie. I, my partner was John Rodriguez. So, you know, they, they ended up spending over a million dollars, boy. That's looking for said. John Rodriguez. Looking for John Rodriguez in jails. and every, How many John Rodriguez you think are in Miami? There's like a thousand. So they go, <laughs> and they sit and do this, and at the end of the trial, the judge goes, guilty. So we waive pretrial sent, uh, reports because he's been in prison. They say, okay, we are to sentencing. So we go to sentencing and, and we, we talk, oh, he's been in inmate in prison. He got, he's doing law work and all this stuff. So the judge says, okay, prosecutor. And he goes, well, we're going to re- recommend time concurrent. I'll never forget this, Paulie. There's a stack of paperwork on the judge's desk. <laughs> he looks at the judge, uh, prosecutor says, stand up. I go, oh, fuck, I'm done. He goes, you're recommending time concurrent? Picks up a pile of paperwork. Boom! Racks it on his desk. You know how the federal courtrooms yeah. are. People don't know what a federal courtroom is like. They are like grandose. The judge is up on this big thing, and, yeah. and you know, you're know you down. It's nothing like a state court. It's mega. And he goes, boom! Now, a federal judge can do anything he wants. Don't let anybody kid you. That's the one person you don't mess with. And he bangs the paper. He goes, you recommending time concurrent? You know this man cost you a million dollars, you told me. And now you're real. What, what kind of deterrent are you? And he's yelling at the, I'm looking, oh, I'm fucked. He's going to slam me. He can do whatever he wants. I know that. So the judge ends up leaning back in his chair. And then he, he leans back and he goes, eh, what am I, a federal judge? Time concurrent. <laughs> I about fell out of my fucking chair. I got the biggest grin on my face. I walked back into the holding cells. And people are there, you know, have to have them crying. They're going to do five years. They're bitching like fuckers. They're, they're ratting the in The shortest there. guys, the guys with the shortest sentence, they, you know, and... They can't do time. They can't it. do it. They, it's, it's like they cry the most. They're, they're always depressed. They're just, you know, doing crazy stuff. And that's why if you didn't have 20, 30 years, you didn't hang around with us. Oh, you had to be a convict. Mm-hmm. If you had to be a convict to come with us, you couldn't have been just a scumbag that got a couple mm-hmm. years and that was it. You know, you and I'm not knocking the guy who gets a legit couple of years or whatever, but usually they're not sent to our prison either. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they come to our house. They're going no. to the Lowe's or some shit. You know, we were going to places where there were stabbings and sure. uh, you know, uh, tell them a little bit about the gang shit in Atlanta and and the area bro, uh, area circle, area nation, oh, area more, uh, that, more fucking gangs, more gang. And we used to, I used to tell the white gangs, I said. You guys are idiots. You're fighting each other. We had like 15% white guys on a yard. And we're fighting each other. Uh, what the fuck is wrong with you people? Well, what they did was they, they would get these young kids to come in and get involved in the crew, in the, in the group. And, and they victimized life. them. And they uh-huh. get in life. I see uh-huh. so many young kids come in, have to stab somebody because they're sitting in their chair. Or oh, you're sitting in our table or some shit. And yeah, I, I, and it's not them that are making the decision. It's some other clown that ain't never going home. And he's telling them, hey, listen, dude, you can't let that happen. Right. Go take care of it, or we're going to run you out of here. You know, so oh, I it saw- was a lot of a lot of politics in, uh, in all prisons. the prison system. Oh, and, and then we, I remember how many lockdowns we were on because we see them all. We see two gangs. I remember we were outside in Edgefield. And we knew what was happening. Do you remember the riot in the unit? When yeah. they all come running up in the unit? 
You know, I was sitting there watching CNN. Tell them what happened that happened. And, and they come running in. One group came running in, and they, Jesus Christ. Stabbing each other. They're and sticking each other. They're doing everything. And, and one kid. We were, we were playing chess. Yeah, or he, he I was a, at a table. I, I remember that. He it, had, it, it, a, he had a, uh, a paintbrush from the art class that he turned around, and he sharpened it in a pencil sharpener. <laughs> he sharpened it. And he made it, he put a hole in that guy. My God, I don't think that that, that pool of blood took like 30 seconds. It and just, it was halfway across the floor. I said, Jesus he's Christ, dead. this guy's dead. You know. Oh, I remember that, right? And, and it was like 40 people around them, throwing chairs, doing everything. Oh, you remember that? They run up into the unit. We're like, what the fuck? Yeah. You know, you kind of know when things are going on in prison. You can feel it. Oh, you, you know, can I tell, tell people, by the way people dress. I, I talk about that all the time, the boy. They dress. When you look into a prison, I, I, I tell people all this time, you know how you find a tough prison? When you walk in there and marrow it's 8 o'clock at night and everybody's walking around with their boots and sneakers. Yeah. Then I go, uh-oh. They, Things they can change, jump off. They change the sneakers for boots. Yeah, or, yeah. or if yeah. they're ready to go. And you see them. You're walking around. They're on the tier. They got you know their hands behind their back or whatever. You can feel that tension. And I, I used yeah. to say, I used to walk into a prison. They're all in flip flops. There's a fuck. They ain't, nothing's gonna no, happen. Ain't yet. nothing happening you with know? flip flops. Yeah. But they 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 had uh, they had it in Edgefield when they did uh, the last riot. They had that I was there when I was there. Well, you, well, you were there. Well, you remember when I got transferred, right? Mm -hmm. They sent me. Uh, where did I go after? Let me see oh, that lighter again. I I went to uh, a Yazoo. Yazoo, Mississippi. Worst really? <laughs> Worst place in the fucking country. Talk about a gang unit. They sent me to this unit after I fucked with them, with the with the, with you know the policies and everything else. They fucking send in. Uh, they send me to Yazoo, Mississippi. So what do they do to me? There was a unit manager there named Brawley. Yeah, you remember? I Brawley. remember Brawley. They make him the SIS. I don't know if you know that. They make they him made him SIS, and they sent him to Yazoo. Yeah, he got there for a month. Guess where I was? At Yazoo, waiting for. And him. guess what happened to me when when he, he got there? Up. He locked me right up. <laughs> I'm fucking like, what the fuck did I do here, man? And he, Lawton, you're running shit. You, you mm. on the off the fucking? They fucking fucking put me in a well, hole for six months. I go, what the fuck did I do here? Look at what happened when we started doing numbers in, in Edgefield. Oh, now you And we were going to the yard. Right? We, we used to do gambling running. The lieutenant come up and he said, you a fucking bookmaker now? <laughs> Why well, wasn't good enough for you? He said, now you're with this nut and you want to go ahead and you two want to be like the biggest book on the compound, right? And we I were. I said, well, <laughs> but everybody's going to get paid. What's the problem? Right. You know, Listen, nobody's he, getting hurt. He, he just said, oh, "Well, don't find, don't let me find out that people ain't getting paid," and that was it. But you know. me, I, cause I fucked with them. They had not. Mm -hmm. They hated me, and you know, I, I used to think about that later and say, you know, if I would, if I, but it is who I am. You know, it, it's the fight in me. It's why I do this channel to open people's eyes to how bad the system is. You know, I used to get the biggest kick out of it. These guys think they're going to go in there and they're just going to lay around there with their buddies and shit. Mm -hmm. They ain't fucking getting woken up at 7 in the morning, get the fuck out of the unit. You're fucking going to work on the fucking yard. You remember we used to have to go to the fucking yard? We got lucky because we went law library. We did law library. Shit. We had all kinds of things going on. But then on, we used but... to go to the yard. You remember? And, and fucking, we used to have thousands of books of stamps. Thousands. And because we stamps was money, that Paulie and I bad. were both in the system when cigarettes were money. Yeah, tell them about what a, a pack of cigarettes would go for in prison when they took. First of all, a lot of people don't notice, and I think it was two thousand one, maybe two thousand two. Two thousand around there, two thousand one, when they really, really cracked down on. They everything. started cracking down. They made cigarettes illegal, illegal, totally illegal. So what did they do? They when created a beautiful black market. They, not only did they create a market, I've saw more stabbings over cigarettes. Oh, yeah. Because the addiction of ta tobacco. <laughs> Tallini smoked, but Tallini, of course, gets a hustle right away. So what does he do? He, has, he, he, he stocks up on Bugle. Bugle is a bag of tobacco you get for three dollars and fifty cents. Two dollars and fifty cents on a yard. And what does he do? How much did a pack of buglers go pack of buglers go for in the hot market uh, uh ounce of bugler costs 250 250 dollars 250 dollars for an ounce of it and believe me he was getting it oh yeah without a question 
I remember when we still had cartons. I remember a carton was going for a thousand dollars. They had a hundred dollars a pack. Yeah. Because they would take a cigarette and make three or four a pin joints, the pin cigarettes, and they'd be how how big. There would be a tiny little thing. Probably smoke too. I, I didn't smoke. I didn't smoke. Tiny so. little thing. And yeah. it, it was so crazy because you would see people doing anything for a I mean, I seen them sucking dick. I seen them doing this. <laughs> I seen them, right? Am I right for a cigarette? They, they, it was fucking nuts. It was a. It was. It was not a. It's an unreal world. And I try to explain that to it, young that people. happens. In it's that. not what you see on TV. No, and it's, it's and, not what you see on TV. And they have. You know, people who don't have anybody or don't have a, a reputation, they really, they really have a rough ride. Have a rough ride, and and it's nothing, it's nothing good. You know what I mean? There, there really is nothing good because you're in an environment where you got a thousand guys on a compound, twelve hundred guys on a compound, or more, and you know, you everybody gets punished for the actions of one person. Oh yeah. So it doesn't matter. You know, you you're going to get punished irregardless. Oh yeah, lockdown. How many you times get locked you down? You do all kinds of crazy stuff. I mean, in today's world, what do you think of these kids? What What do you think these kids can do and young people can do? Obviously, respect the law. We know that. Well, and, and don't think you're going to get away with everything. You're, you're not going to get away with anything because today, the way the laws are, say you did something right now, okay? In 19 years, 364 days later. <laughs> Somebody gets caught doing something, and they said, "Hey, listen, I was with Larry and Paul, and we did this." You don't remember what you ate for breakfast last week. This guy's remembering what he did 19 years ago. You know what I mean? Because what? the statute of limitation is 20. Well, it depends. It's it depends. five. Well, but money if it's laundering. Conspiracy. If it, they throw money laundering and uh, stuff, I'd in like there. to emphasize this to the people out there: the statute of limitation is five years. But, yeah. but, On what Paulie is getting at is if it's four years and Paulie gives Larry Lawton a call and says, hey, Larry, and I'm clean. Hey, Larry, do you know any drug dealers over there that can help me out? I say, nah, Paul, I'm not into it. That now constitutes me for another five years because I'm involved in a conspiracy mm -hmm. to commit a crime. And I, I look at that Paulie and I, and I try to tell people, listen to me. If you keep even associating with those kind of people, you're done. Oh, you're through. It, you know, it comes a time in your life where you got to say, now we're older. We're going to be talking, a lot of my audience is young. You and I, to this day, try to help young people stay out of prison. You know, that's our goals. Because, you know, one, we have kids. I have yeah, people who are in this channel know my son runs my social media. He's 31. And you have, what, how old are your kids? My kids are all old now, except for the baby. The, uh... They're in their forties. My Tony is Tony's like thirty six, and you know it, it's amazing how you and I have kept our he's kids. He's got kids. He's got kids. My I, my grandkids. My you know. too. Me too. My, I, my I came home at this. He was the same age as me when I went away. When I came home, and his grand his children were the same age as he was when I went away. And you know, it, 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 I often say this, and and people who know that I interviewed my daughter and my son, and we're gonna do more of that. And it's time you can't get back, man. Oh, well, you can't get back any of that. I mean, you lost 30 years of your life. Obviously, it's still, I, you know, it's I look a, at this and say how blessed we are, one, to be here, and two, to have relationships. Well, to, to have, with my wife stuck with me forever. She, and, and we're still together now. We're just separated because of the coronavirus, and she's in South America, I'm here. But that's a rarity. Uh, you rarity. know, you know my f both wives. My first wife was Rosalind, uh, and then when I got arrested, it was Missy. Mm -hmm. And you know Missy, and what my my youngest was just twenty four. And I and I look back and oh, listen. You can't get that time back, and I get it and all that. And, and and but the best thing we can do at our age is try to prevent some of these young people to think one, it's cool. One, oh, the fast way is, is the easy way. I, I was talking to you in the RV, and as you guys know, I do this from the RV. And I came here to Central Florida. Paulie's in Orlando, and I came here. And, and whenever I see Paulie, it's like old home week. But we, we talk about it, and, and you, you can't get that time back no matter what Nothing. you do. 
It's but we just talked in the RV, and I said to Paul, I said, Look, you know, we said, oh, I can make a quick 50000 There's no question Paul he can make a drug deal right now for anything he wants. His word is good to this day, and mine too, with the mob and everybody. But I know it's the first and quickest way back to prison. Oh, Because yeah. once someone's telling on you. Oh, they're definitely they're going to tell on you sooner or later. You know, they're going to get in trouble, then they're going to give you up. Period. Period. And, and then and the feds will love to get Talini or Lawton. Oh, sure. You know what they'd love to do to say, look at that YouTube guy. We got him. He thinks he can. Oh, he was a criminal all along. He was. And I am so cautious about that, about being around the right people. You have to be, because today is, is not the. When we went away, it was treacherous at, at, at two. But now it's more treacherous because these kids come up with the idea that they already know before they do anything, they're going to tell on you. It's called being the first on the bus. And they're going to tell on you. But it's not only that. You can have, I'll give you an example. They had Mario, uh, Mauricio Ochoa. I was in Miami with him. Right? That's that big drug dealer. He was, he was the nephew of, 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 Ochoa, of the big Ochoa. Of the big Ochoa brothers, right? Yeah, right, right. The biggest, uh, they, they were like they were rivals with, they with, were with the... They were with partners with Pablo Escobar. Right. But they turned around, they had two guys in there, and in, in, uh, Cruz and Puma was his name, right? They were two, two drug dealers, Cubans, and uh, Puma was in a camp with Mauricio back in that, a really early 80s. And he ran into him again in 89, and they said, listen, this is Fabio Ochoa's nephew, you know? So they made up a story about a drug deal that they did together. Which never happened. Never happened. They, Mauricio got life. Over that, over, over that, the bullshit, over, over that, the lie. Over the lie. They made a whole story up, and, and the prosecutor, you know, they ate it up. They ate it up because now they got an Ochoa, and he's a big family. You know, the family was a big in drugs and shit back in the day. And they turned around, and they got this fucking kid a life sentence, right? I was his son's godfather because the, I was at the baptismal, so I was the child's right. godfather then. And he ended up dying. He got AIDS in jail. He was started fucking around and doing drugs and doing all kinds yeah, of yeah. shit. Because Prison he has life. everything. I he tell got, people this. Yeah, this. There's 20% uh, hepati hepatitis is like 40%. Or more. For whatever, 40 I think HIV C, was 20%. HIV was a lot. It was they very high. Back in the day when you yeah. were dying yeah. from it. So they, they ended up uh, doing that. He, he got the life sentence. And it came out like 10 or 15 years later that they lied on his case. But... He's, he's dead. died. He's dead. You know, so he died. You know, his his wife, beautiful uh, American woman, and he has a, a beautiful son. And you know, he grew up with all without all that, like we did. We grew up without our children. You know what I mean? And and it's a very difficult. Yeah, my daughter was thirteen months old, uh, fifteen yeah. months old when I went away. I get out. She's thirteen. Mm -hmm. My son was six. You know, like you just talk talk mm -hmm. to Larry. And he was 18 when I got out. And I look at that. All those years, baseball, this, every fucking all thing in the, the world. All the things. You know, my daughter like, only knew me from prison. Yeah, the just phone, like your phone call. My kids knew yeah. me by the phone. Yeah. You know. They all know to hit five. I was a <laughs> AT. <laughs> right. They all know to hit number five because in prison. AT&T dad. They, they, tell them what you do. In prison, you got to. First of all, what do they do in prison with a phone? They tax your family. Mm-hmm. Tell them oh, how it was crazy. I used how, to. Have, how much money did you spend a month on a phone? A lot. And I, what I would do is. I remember that. I was doing because I called Columbia three I, or four or five times a week. Paul, and I it remember was it. Fifteen dollars for a fifteen-minute call. Hear that? Fifteen dollars for fifteen minutes just to talk to somebody. And I used in to America it was uh, four bucks, three ninety yeah, something. Yeah, they they rob you. They, they, they rob they, you. They rob the families. You're already depressed. You're. You, you know, financially, your family's struggling and everything. And they you turn around and they, here's the system and they're robbing you for phone they're, minutes. They're robbing the family. I could have got, they are. They, and I could have got that same card, a prepaid card, for three cents a minute. And I'm paying a dollar. You know, the prison system is nothing but a money thing. And I, I, everybody on this channel who knows me, one of my biggest things is to get rid of private prisons. Oh, definitely. They just closed one in Florida. 
Uh, uh, listen, I actually talked to a, a football player, a really good guy, Jeff. People might know him from my channel, uh, ex-NFL player. He had stock in him. After I spoke with him, he stole all his stock. Because it's nothing but making money off the hardship of people. Mm -hmm. And they, and Human you know, suffering. that people say, oh, we can do it better. You know, I actually had a guy from private prison tell me, he goes, Larry, he goes, you're right. He goes, because the food, they would drop it under 50 cents a day per person. Under 50 cents a day to feed For them. three meals. For three meals. And all what they were doing in the private prisons is, you know, we had a guard on each unit. They would put one guard in a unit. Mm -hmm. Now, even the feds did that after a while. If you Yeah, they have one for both sides. Both, and at the midnight That's show. why the morning was the, the, the most the, dangerous time. Oh, because when they, you open that door, they, they would be on the other unit. Door, and they'd be on the other unit. There'd be and riots. There'd be fucking riot going on. There'd be all kinds of craziness happening for like an hour, and nobody would know nothing. Nothing. I was in Yazoo, talk about a gang unit, and my buddy Ron and I, he's another good friend of mine from the joint, really good convict, old guy. Great, he's 70 now. What a big convict, been in Pelican Bay. I mean, he was the real deal. Him and I were close, and I still to this day talk to him. Mm -hmm. And we, we, we knew what was going on. You know, we know we, you could feel the tension. Sure enough, they open it up. Out comes everybody on one side. These two guys square up. Fucking, I mean, it was a bloodbath. And then what happens when they bloodbath that? Three more guys from this side? That's enough. No, that's a... Well, you know, it's eight guys. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, they had a lookout on on the door. And when the door come, everybody split. There's blood on the floor, blood everywhere. They fucking, they called chow. You know, in the morning, you, stay, they, mm -hmm. you remember they called chow. There's blood. This guard was a rookie. He didn't know what the fuck to do. Where he, they called the <laughs> lieutenant. They all of a sudden were in the chow hall. Lockdown. Lockdown, all people back to the unit, lockdown. And where the fuck, and I'm like, oh, shit, this is going to be a while. Because yeah. it was a bloodbath. I mean, a bloodbath. Then the cameras came out, and they saw everything, and, you know, obviously. Yeah, they're and, supposed to be on the cameras anyway, you know. But yeah, not, we know, we know not that. And not only that, it's so funny how in prison, they don't put cameras where they need them, like in the hole. They beat your ass so bad in a hole. I, I remember when I was tortured and beaten. I was a, a Lamana. You remember how he hated mm -hmm. me, that fucking cocksucker? What this, did I call him? He, I used to say he looked like a TWA pilot. Oh, Lamana. Did, I, ha did I hate that? Pre you know, he's in a private prison system now, I think. Well, I imagine that he is. He was the biggest piece of shit because I wouldn't quit writing senators and congressmen. He tried to shut me up. And that's when, after that, then they transferred me. Well, first they brought me back on the yard, if you remember this, and the associate warden came to me. I was smoking a Diablo. You remember the little Diablos mm -hmm. I used to get? Little cigars. And I'm walking, I'm white. Because when you're in the hole a long time, you come out. Everybody knows. I'm, hey, Lawton's back, Lawton's back. I'm white. But I'm on the yard. I can barely walk. You know, you can't walk. No, you, you only walk in a little You, little you are space. really in some, I mean, you don't don't understand how bad the hole is to a person. It's, it's really cruel and unusual punishment. Yeah. So I'm walking the yard trying to get strength back, and the associate warden comes up to me. Lawton! And I'm like, I don't give a fuck now anyway. He comes up to me, and he says, listen, we'll give you a get out of free jail card. You know what that meant. And we'll give you any prison you want. We'll give you a single cell. Just stop this shit. And I, I was such a hard head. I says, fuck you. I said, why don't you go talk to the dude that, that you fucking abused in that hole. That, that little uh, a veteran had no leg. That and they, cripple guy. The they cripple, left on the bunk. Left him on a bunk. He wouldn't Full of feed, feces. Feces and, and shit. Even, f I'll never forget this, Finity. Lieutenant <laughs> Finity. You remember him? I hated him. That little fuck. But he was, I give him all of this. He, he was a lieutenant of hole at the time. He comes up to my cell, you know, the window. He's got a camera on that guy. And I wrote this. It's in, a, in, a, in documents. And, he, write, and he, he looks, he goes, if anybody on the outside saw this video, somebody here would be in prison, meaning tell him. Because he wanted to get that guy out of the hole. Yeah. And they wouldn't transfer the guy. Because this guy didn't belong in the hole. He had no, no legs. They just couldn't take care of him. And fucking, of course, what, what do you think Larry does? Right away. Writes every fucking buddy in the <laughs> book. And when I wrote every... I, you remember that? I, was, I, I remember. I, but that's the, that's the abuse. I mean, I had a kid. Uh, he was from... Uh, I think he was from Philly. He ate his radio. 
Literally, he ate the radio. He ate the radio. He broke the radio up and ate. They gave him a radio to calm him down. To the psychologist of Oh yeah, tell me how many wackos. And really then he he ate the batteries and he ate the radio. He broke the radio up and he ate it. And then he wiped feces all over yeah, himself and all the over the room. And, and these people have mental problems. They don't they don't need to be in a in a correctional institution they need to be getting medication they need to be getting counseling and, ma- ma- that, ma- and they don't have that i, I talk about that. that all the time i was in a hole so much and you too that i, I they, and and the prison hides those guys they put them at the end of the tier and when there's a uh, it, i used to get a kick out of this do you remember how i used to fuck with them when they say oh the aca is coming american mm-hmm. credit association you know uh-huh. credit association. association yeah credit to, to accreditate the prison that's when we got good food for a day oh yeah they paint everything, put new shit out, no shit. The minute those fuckers left, everything was taken away. We were fucked. And I used to fucking used to, and we, and I was in a hole when they did that. And I watched them take one of the guys and literally gag him. Oh, yeah. Put him in the corner cell. And I'm talking about a mental guy who, what you said, used to take feces, this crap, and write demonic stuff on the walls with, with feces. I remember because the unit, you know, in the hole, you know, the way the tears are in the hole, I would fucking be like gagging from the smell. Oh, the whole <laughs> I remember unit when they stink. douched them with the, the shit. They used to make the fucking bombs when the they come by. And throw it on them. Throw it on them. And I used to get so sick that what they did to that guy because he didn't belong there. He'd be singing and fucking going crazy. And, well, and, and, and how many suicides did I see and you see? <laughs> how many guys overdosed did we see? A lot. You know, because there's so much drugs in prison. Heroin is rampant. Any drug you want. You know is what? Rampant. You know what? They, 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 It kills me too. Is they'll turn around, and they'll catch a guy in there. He'll have a pound of pot, and then they'll try to say, "Well, he got a visit like a year ago." Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like they don't know it's a fucking guard bringing it. Yeah, in. you know, and they they cover it up. But you know, that's all the bullshit that they go on or that's going on in the system. And it's it's even worse today because... I, I, you know, you're more... You know, to let everybody know, Paulie is still very connected. And when I want to get information out of a prison, I call Paulie because he has his tentacles because of legal work. Legal. Let me tell you that. He, he Now they have email. When Paulie and I were in, they didn't have email. No. And they charge him for email. I don't think it's free for those guys either. Mm-hmm. But anyway, Paulie has tentacles into... Probably what? How many I got, prisons? I got uh, probably 70. 70, 70 prisons. prisons. He can connect different. with somebody to get a message out into the prison system. And that's why you're saying it's where I didn't know what, what's going on today that it's just... Well, now it's just with the with the virus. The, the probably... The virus, I think, is an excuse for, for them to... I was to, just going to go there. To... to, to you know, they, they lock you down and they don't have to worry about you. You know what I mean? You're locked in your room 24 hours and a day. And they got the money, so the region got, don't give They already shit. got everything they need. You know? The region don't Remember, they used to not like lockdowns because it cost money. Because it cost too much money. They used to have to bring in the counselors and, the, and they'd be feeding us because we were in a lockdown. Mm-hmm. And they used to say, oh, it's costing them well, prison money. Well, now they're giving them sandwiches for a week. You know yeah, I mean? literally a cold. You're lucky if you got two pieces of bologna on a piece of bread. Yeah. You get a uh, what are those things they used to give you on the uh, a, on a, the a carton of fucking the little bullshit meal. Yeah, they used to give you a carton of fucking jungle, jungle juice, the jungle, bullshit. Yeah. Uh, a pack of outdated crackers. Everything was outdated. Every fucking thing. I talk about that on this station, Everything. on this channel all the time. I talk about what they. I I when I was in Atlanta. I was in USP Atlanta. I was in there from 97 to 99. And I was in the kitchen with uh, Nicky Scarfo, Vic Arena, all the guys. And they, I worked in the kitchen because that's where all the mobsters went. You know, they used to get us jobs in the kitchen. Mm-hmm. And we used to fucking smuggle everything out anyway. I chipped a tooth, Paulie, because the food, the meat, was so fucking bad. What shit I've ever ate in my life? And went down below. And it had Desert Storm meat from 92. Mm-hmm. The box said 1992. This is 1997. And they got 92 meat. And people go, no, nah, they don't do that. Are you kidding me? Oh, yeah, they do. Tell them about Con Air. Con Air's worse. They don't give you shit. And you, and you can't shit on that plane. No. 
Don't think you're going to get up and take a shit and they're going to take your cuffs off and shackles and leg iron. I ain't taking nothing. You're, you're done. You'll shit your pants. I mean, I've seen some crazy shit on those planes. The worst thing I had on Con Air was because when you transfer... Do you remember the Indian? For, the when, big Indian in Oklahoma City? When you do this here, listen. You have a black box oh, that an inmate fucking designed for them. And they got like 75 bucks for it, right? It was the <laughs> worst, most cruel fucking position. Because you're like this. You can't scratch your nose. You can't do nothing. And when you come out, like I would go from one prison to another. And usually it was because I was under investigation. They'd hold me in the hole for a fucking year. And then they'd say, okay, you're getting out tomorrow. Pass <laughs> all your stuff out. And I said, oh, really? I'm getting out? Everything's over? Yeah, you're getting out. Don't worry. Getting transferred. I, they, they didn't say nothing about no transfer. So you put your stuff outside the door. You know, they, they, oh, come they, and they get, lose that. Then they come and get you, and they say, all right, and you're going on the bus to the airplane, but you're going in a black box. And it's, it's the most uncomfortable, inhumane way to travel, right? And it's not because you're a violent person or anything else. It's because you're coming out of a segregation. They use it for violent people, too, but... If you're coming also, out of the hall, they fuck with you. Yeah, and when they want to bust your balls, that's what they, they do. And they the do biggest that. thing, when I sued them for, for the masturbation thing, they transferred me. I mean, I, again, they changed the policy, but what they also did was lose all my legal work. All that. That's definitely gone. They lose your legal work, which you take years. Now, what people don't understand in prison is you can't just run around with your legal work. They don't let you come on the yard with legal work. It was guys like me. Remember when I had the connection? I used to get people's paperwork in. And I was pulling time. their paperwork. <laughs> now, hey, remember we pulled it for the, uh, what was the name of that fucking gang? The Hammers. The <laughs> Hammers. What were they called? Uh, some fucking. The, the, some white supremacist kind of bullshit. Group, right? <laughs> so, so the headshot caller, he comes in, he wants to pay. Yeah, I want to know everybody about my guys. Here's all the thing. And he's talking all this crazy shit. And so we fucking got the paperwork. I, I'm sure I did. I got and everybody's then, no, paperwork. No, we got the paperwork. And then he was the snitch. Was the snitch. <laughs> so we're looking and debating about it. And you come and say, man, come on. This dude wants to talk to me in the kitchen. We had to go to breakfast that day, remember? Oh, and so You and me, time. we're in the fucking kitchen with these two gorillas. And they don't want anybody knowing about the paperwork. And I said, well, dude, listen to me. We already told you, we don't want to hear that bullshit. You asked for it as a favor. Right. We gave you the favor. If you don't like what you're reading, that's on you. You deal with what you want to deal with. We never went with, you and I were very good at, at that. I never went on, oh, because you hear people, oh, he's a rat, he's a yeah, rat. Yeah, they, they, I don't listen. know. Listen, they want to do it to deflect off themselves. Exactly. What I used to do, and you remember that, I had my outside guy, my buddy Steve, I used to pull the paperwork. The docket sheets, mm -hmm. and they don't lie. And no, because it's in there. You That's just have legal. to know how to read them. Exactly, you have to know how to read it, and we know it. You know, but they, uh, yeah, they they were all upset with that because their boss was the fucking the stool pigeon. The stool pigeon, and and it, you know, it believe me, there's so much crap. And like Paul, he said earlier, there's a lot of politics. There's a lot of, but it's. I try to emphasize so much how you can't get yourself wrapped in this today in this free world. Like you and I talked about my RV earlier when Paulie just saw my RV. He goes, "This is this is fucking unbelievable." He goes, "This I could live in this." And you know what he said to me? He goes, "Larry, I got a closet now. Literally, my closet is bigger than the cell I lived in." Mm -hmm. And and I, I I look at that and it's so true. I, I mean how lucky we are I, I, I'm, I got an RV and I love it and to this day Paul I don't care what we do in life it's easy for you and me to live like nothing because we did we mm -hmm. survived we're, are we a little crazy there's no fucking doubt we're both a little fucking well, nuts it's a little listen I have uh, you PTSD. know like I told you the other day Absolutely. I have emotional moments I have I have times when you know I'll be trying to say something and I forget and then I'll, I I'll remember, you know what I mean? Serious like PTSD. earlier in this in this video, I couldn't remember Southern Career Institute, which was where I studied and graduated and became a paralegal and a paralegal specialist, yeah. right? And and that was in '92, you know what I mean? And I and I, sometimes the words just just uh, escape you. Not only that, like I still to this day I don't sleep well. No. Uh, you know, and I sometimes Teresa. You know, with me, she'll see me have a dream or something, and I get up 
fucking ready to fucking kill somebody or oh, ready man. to do something. And she goes, wow. She goes, or oh, you know what's the worst me for me now, Paulie? I really can't. Like, you know those restraint chairs and shit you hear them killing people in? Mm-hmm. I was strapped down naked. In, on, in, in four-point restraints. In, in four-point restraints. And that's when they pissed on me. And, and I get such a fucking feeling. I, I can't take it, Paul. It, no, it's, it's, I, I, it Teresa get... sees it and she goes, change that. Change the channel. I can't look at that shit because it, something clicks yeah, into it, me. It will, it will click. It will click back in your brain. It, it does it when, like, when I see things out here, like, you know, a, a moment, you know what I mean, where a soldier is coming back from uh, overseas and he's, he's meeting his kids and shit, you know. And I get emotional. Oh, I do too. I do. Behind that. I totally, I, I, you know, I told somebody you'll love this one. I, I told people. I remember being in a, in a, in a TV room. I mean, we were in Atlanta. And we, there was a fucking some killers, you know. Crazy. Atlanta was the worst prison Atlanta at the was, time. Uh, Atlanta was nuts. It was the worst prison at the mm-hmm. time. And here were a couple of us are crying. Not a motherfucking soul said a fucking thing. Because we were getting emotional over something. Because, you know, we have families. We have sure. things. And what you say is so true. You know, to this day, certain things touch me in such a way. I get, I, I cry. I, I've caught myself crying one time for, I don't know what reason. And, and it was it was like, man, what's wrong with me? You know, and, and that's deep. That's deep. That's PTSD. That's, that's, that's yeah, that's, it's, that's it's shit. definitely. I talked to a couple of people and psychologists and stuff and. And they said that's you know you're definitely suffering from it you know you can't you not just, you Paulie, can't you, you can't, can't do thirty fucking years and not be affected. No, we try to put on our fronts and we're good at it and we we've learned to adapt to this life because we are you know I <laughs> someone asked me about Paulie that I'm going to see you know and I I always talk always about you and I said let me tell you something about Paulie. I said Paulie was one of the best guys to do time with. I says and second. I can drop Paulie off naked in Orlando. Tell me to meet with not a dime in his pocket. Tell me to meet me in fucking Boston and he'll come there with a suit and a fucking car and a fucking thousand dollars in his pocket. Because you're a survivor. That's how. You have to. You know, we, we learn to survive, you and me. And that's something that I don't think young people get. It will, it's such a lasting effect on us. I think that they, they have, they, 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 they really don't understand the consequences of their actions. It's, it's like, I, I try to educate my clients and, you know, make them understand that, you know, first of all, tell them about, I, I, whenever I recommend Paulie, which I do a lot, and obviously to this day I will reckon I'll put up his stuff again in the links below, you're going to get Paulie's information as well. The people don't get what eight years to four years means. Mm-hmm. When Paulie could save four years off your sentence. I don't know what he charges. I really don't. But I don't give a fuck what it is. It's worth it. Because that that four years will fuck a guy's head up more than people oh, even it know. Was, listen, or 10. Or a life sentence. Or a 20-year sentence to a 10-year sentence. Whatever it is. Mm-hmm. It will mess your head up to the fact that, you know, at what point is your life worth whatever it is? You know? Sure. Well, you gotta, that's when you have to make a decision. You know what I mean? What well, we do? hope, you and I, we hope young people make that decision before they go in. Well, they, they should be making the decision not to get in trouble and go in. That's, that, that's, that's what, what they I really meant, need to do. Uh, obviously. But when they do make mistakes, and everybody does, Paulie, come on. You know, you know, we were young. We were crazy. Listen, I was invincible. I didn't think I was going to, and if I got caught, who cared? I don't give a fuck. I'll go I didn't think I'd live to 50. No, I didn't think I was. They told me I wouldn't live till I was 18 when I was a kid. <laughs> You know what I mean? They said, no, nah, he'll be dead by the time he Well, uh, he listen, I was 12. You know my story. I was 12 when I started with bookmaking and, and mm. running tickets. And it was funny because I really, in my life, even when I went to prison, and I knew I had a date. So I was different. I know the guys with life. And I beat the life sentence. So I, I'm like a happy guy. But then I go to Atlanta, and we had 880 life sentences. Out of 2,000 inmates. Well, look at Edgefield. Edgefield, Edgefield same, same way. Same, same way. Same exactly. But matter of fact, a lot of the guys from Atlanta went to Edgefield mm-hmm. when they opened Edgefield. You remember? You were one of them. Yeah. You were, you went to Edgefield, and Edgefield was off the charts they too. Said, that, yeah, that, that was my punishment. You, you know, know, going to Edgefield. You, you okay. know the first thing too. That was I, from where was we in Coleman when Coleman, I got shipped. Coleman. Yeah. And, and I get a kick out of this for people. They they mm-hmm. you know they they say oh it's a new prison. 
I don't give a fuck. New, old, they treat you like a scumbag. And Edgefield was a new, looked nice. But it was they good. They fuck put with gun, you. They had gun towers. They shot on the yard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they see a bunch of people grouping up. Oh, man. Just, out uh, comes the fucking right. You remember that? Rifles. rifles. They were shooting at us. I remember me and Vicarina, we were walking the yard one day, and, and there was a fight broke out on the basketball court, and the fucking guy in the tower starts shooting, and Vic's saying, get down, get down. And I'm like, I'm not laying in the dirt. You know, and he's saying, get down. All of a sudden, bang, a bullet goes near you, you're down. Then you go down. Then oh, man, down. I remember, I, remember the, I was on Atlanta. I was on Atlanta for five days in 97, right? I come out of the hall after captain's review. I'm on the yard five days. Vic Arena really helped me out because he gave me a bag. He got I, I suitcased the uh, suitcase. You know what that uh -huh. is. I suitcased the note from somebody, and I give it a. He takes care of me. Gets the bag. I'm on the yard five fucking days, Paulie. A dude gets stabbed. Five, six, seven people in front of me on the chow lot because they had both sides. Mm -hmm. They fucking took the fucking dude out. You know what they did? Kept going. Chow. Sure. They closed that side. They kept Chow going. Yeah. Now, of course, they locked the whole prison well, down. Well, now they lock everything down real quick. Yeah. You know, I mean, they, they've evolved as far as that goes, the the the, the speed of a response. They, oh. they really have a rapid response now. And they come running in with, like, these paintball guns with oh, pepper, the, pepper oh, balls, pepper and, balls shit, and, and everything. And they, and they and will they, shoot you quick. Quick. Them they rubber bullets on play. <laughs> they, fucking, they will, they will juke you up really. Yeah, really oh, well. I remember a guy got shot with a rubber bullet, and we thought, did he die? He didn't die, but boy, I saw that dude after he got after he got out of the hole for sixty days or whatever he was. He still had a fucking mark on him. Oh yeah, you know. So I seen him when when I was in the hole waiting to go for another transfer, and I'm in the hole, and these two young guys big big strong guys and they they covered up the door and oh. i seen it i said oh jesus oh yeah oh, yeah. oh i used to do so that so i start getting the towel and i'm wetting it and getting i'm getting it and i'm putting it under the door and and stuff because he knows the gas is coming the gas is coming i know <laughs> it's coming right and they come in and I they tell them you got one opportunity this is it they, and they, they got come. all the videos and cameras which and Which means shit, nothing. Which means nothing. But they, they had it. And these guys said, fuck you. We ain't coming out. I did out. that. And they opened the food slot. And they hit that boom, boom, boom. Like three shots, right? With those little gas pellets in there. And I said, here it comes. And I got this new kid in the cell with me. And he's looking at me like I'm crazy. I said, listen, get, the, get your towel wet and get it ready to put over your face. Because that shit's coming. Yeah. <laughs> I was you know gassed. I mean? I, when I was going crazy in the hole, they won first time. They, they, they opened the shoot door, right? I was, I was the idiot. I was fighting them the wrong way at that yeah. time. And I put up the thing over the window. Fuck, you better open. Fuck you. You better open this door. Fuck you. And they hated it when you open, close, close, yeah. covered that window. Oh, yeah. They didn't like that. So they all. opened the thing. The first, they dropped it. They didn't shoot. They dropped the, uh, 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 not first they did the second one. They dropped the gas thing. Oh my God! Your snot's coming out of your nose. You're on the floor. They drag you out. It's done. Yeah, you, you can't. You ain't breathing. No, no, yeah. no. Next time, I said, "Okay, I know what they're gonna do." So I put my mattress, you know, the thin. They used to get this thin mattress, this thick, fucking nothing. But I get it and I hold it up over the door, you know, I'm cursing them out. They push the broom handle and they drop the concussion grenade. <laughs> I never knew what a fucking concussion <laughs> grenade was. <laughs> Boom! <laughs> Boom! <laughs> I fall down. I don't remember anything, of course. Boom. Dragged out. Four-pointed. Boom. I'm fucking, man. I, I am so, you know, it's a crazy now, Paul. Yeah, you know, I, I went for an MRI one time. I can't get in a machine. I am so bad. Not a class of four. I, 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 I never was like that, Paul. Mm -hmm. I am so whacked out now. And then the next time, they came in with the, the shields. Remember the shock shields? With the they, shock shield. And they fucking got me. That's when I said, I can't win. And I started the pen you have to listen Pil paulie told me that in the beginning but i was a thick-headed dude i was a lot younger than paulie well not a lot but enough that I, I, you know he had a lot more time in already than me and and i thought oh yeah yeah, yeah. and then he used to say like <laughs> he used to see me go to the hole he's uh he's going I'll to say, the hole what again. the fuck did he do now <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
and they're like, <laughs> he just won't stop. Yeah. You know. <laughs> he used to ask the guards. You remember, hey, what's happening with Lawton? What's happening with Lawton? And Listen, they were, they were easy. Like w when we were talking about the MRSA earlier when, oh, with, yeah. the, with that Raleigh James, she sent me so much information. And then it, it ended up, it started in the L.A. County Jail, and it spread throughout the California system, then naturally come into the federal system. This is system. what we're talking about, a pandemic. It really yeah. was, and, especially and in it, the prison system. And it was a real pandemic. Yeah. Who hard. died? What was the kid that died, uh, the, the outlaw? Freddie. Ah, uh, Freddie. Yeah. Freddie died from and that. They you know, Mercer, he went, they took him out, and he ended, they weren't giving us the right antibiotic, you mm -hmm. remember? They were given the wrong antibiotic, and it got worse. And by the time they took him out of the prison, he died. Yep. He died. A lot of guys got, got hurt, like got died. Died. You know, got How many guys, of, I thought about limbs. that the other day. How many people we know died? A lot. And, and you know, I think back about that and say how lucky we were not, not to, you know, I often think about that and say, you know, we are kind of the lucky guys that got away a little bit. Well, you know, I guess there was a purpose, you know, they say God has a purpose for everybody. I think our purpose was to do what we're doing right now. Absolutely. I, uh, you know, Paul, I, I would really never believe that. I do too, because I never know. I never thought I'd be where I am now, having a, a platform now to open people's eyes to tell the truth. Because I don't give a fuck. No. You know, I never did. Listen, they. they I am going to expose. I don't care. You know, I, I, I make sure I don't do anything illegal, and I am going to expose the crap that goes on in these prisons and jail and jails did, did, listen right now in in puerto rico that's where I'm, uh, I'm a lot of my clients are coming out of because it's uh the number one drug drug hub in the in the caribbean and they'll turn is it around, puerto rico is oh, puerto rico's like miami in the 80s wow and what they are doing down in puerto rico i have guys that contact me and they'll ask me for help because they've been in jail and pre-trial detention right for four years what four years and then i look at their docket sheet i say well, give me your case number you know let me check is it, you gotta is verify it, is this everything great we got this we you know we have the uh the pacer uh, pacer i love it i have that. i, I mean, got i'm I, the one who told you about you that show, you showed me how to use it i didn't know nothing about that shit. but now i'm really yeah, pretty good at, good at it, it. <laughs> and i can i can find out the information i want i can get everything off because in the pre-trial uh, consultation part of my business, I turn around and I go on there and I just use all the evidence and everything and I can see what the government's going to use to enhance them and then I'll do a uh, background on them sure. to, to identify mitigating factors. You know what I mean? Like the guy was fucking abandoned when he was a child. Sure, uh, all girl, of those things with the girl, 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 girl they will affect your sentence. She was raped, uh, she was molested, or something, and and all these things have a factor. There's three hundred, and there's over three hundred mitigating factors that have been accepted by the courts around the country. So when you present, really present it, you just can't say it. You have to have evidence, right? And you you do a thorough investigation, and you present it to the court before the guy's going to even make a deal. Because now you can show them, if you plead guilty, this is what the government's going to do, and they're going to try to, they're telling you 10 to life. You don't face 10 to life. That's a statutory penalty. Yeah. Your guidelines are going to be this. So I break it all down for them, and I, I educate them. I teach them. But when I'm looking at these cases in Puerto Rico, and I'm like, Four years, you know, because I don't believe them. You guys got to see it, yeah. you know. And then when I see it, I say, my God, this guy's been in fucking jail. They never filed discovery. Everything is negotiated. They're trying to get the guy to plead guilty from day one. And, and I they say, keep extending How his, his the speedy hell? trial. Yeah, they right? give me, oh, well, this is for the speedy trial clock, this one. This is for this. And and they, are, they, they can't let everything go for speedy trial violation. You know, you... You have to have, it has to, you get 30 days to answer a motion. You get so many days to do this. And there's a formula for it. So when you start adding up these days, I'm looking at guys and they got 700 days that are not on the speedy trial clock. You know what I mean? And that's being... So what's going on over there? Is it, is it because they're overloaded and they can't so, handle it? It's so corrupt. Corrupt. It's nothing. It's, and, and this is what I tell them. I say, listen... Let's look at the reality of the situation. There's so much money coming in 
dirty money, and it's like any other major city. The, the, the crimes existing, the fucking drugs are booming, people are making a lot of money, so they get, in, they get arrested. Now they go to the lawyer, and the lawyer says, okay, it's going to be uh, 50,000 50 now. 50 or 300,000. Doesn't matter what the figure is. But they give it to him in cash. Now the guy goes and he pleads guilty, and then they, they get, they, he starts cooperating, and then they say, hey, how much did you pay your fucking lawyer? I gave him 300000 in cash. And they look, and the lawyer only claimed <laughs> so 50. So they get the lawyers. They get fifty grand, right? He says, oh, 50 grand. So now they know he's lying on his taxes for the two fifty in cash that he's got. That's the lawyer. The lawyers, right? So they'll turn around, and they'll go to the lawyer. And they'll say, all right, listen, here's the deal. You can continue to be a lawyer, and this is the evidence we got against you. He's already got cooperating. He's a reliable informant for the fucking federal government. And he said he gave you a bag with 300000 You only claimed fifty. So you're money laundering the 250000 And they start making deals with them. Now the lawyer, he's a whore for the, for for the, the, feds. Feds, for the feds. And they fuck the clients. Boy, if you that's know. not a reason to get you. And, and <laughs> listen, an listen I'm fighting with lawyers now. They try, they try to challenge me about what I'm saying. I, and everything I say, I give people case law to oh, show I know them you do. what it is. Yeah. And the lawyers, I mean, I already had two of them out of Puerto Rico going crazy. And they called the uh, Bar Association saying here you were in Florida saying I was practicing law. And you're not. And I'm not practicing law. I'm just educating people. That's right. You're a consultant. As to, I'm a consultant. I'm educating people. This is the reality of your situation, son. You're going to get fucked, and this is what they're going to do to you. This is how they're going to do it. Now, you can offset that by mitigating factors in your history, but we have to find them that are acceptable, and they can offset everything. Yeah. Or they'll give the judge something to hang his hat on so that so he doesn't he, look everybody real stupid. Say, yeah, 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 gotcha. so, so that way they get the least or below what they're supposedly going to get if they didn't have that information. But lawyers don't have the time oh, we to do that. what I do. You know what I mean? They're not doing that. They'll do that after you plead guilty or after you're convicted. Now, all of a sudden, it's a rush yeah, to do they, this. Yeah, they want to get their next guy in. You know, and, 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 and if you think about it, if you, you're, they're telling you you're facing 10 to life, and they, then the next word out of their mouth is, well, even though we negotiate a specific sentence, the judge doesn't have to go along with it. And the prosecutors never give up their right to seek an enhancement if it's in the PSI. Right. The only one who talks to the PSI guy is the prosecutor. Yeah. Your lawyer's not talking to the probation department. And you're not. They and you to. ain't. They come and visit you after they get all the information, and they already think that you're the devil, so they're walking in, and they already have the attitude with you, and they go through the form. It's a simple form. I use the same form to do my pretrial to, to people. consultant. I give them the same formula, and I say, okay, we need to answer all these questions, and now we can look to really know what you're going to face. Well, you're, you're, you're doing what, what we need more of. Obviously, there's not guys like you or myself. I don't do the law anymore, obviously. I'll, I'll case you go, you'll case, you'll call me and say, hey, check this case out, especially 924C. That's one I sent you the other yeah, day? Yeah, the other day. And, uh -huh. and I looked, I said, boy, this one. And he goes, yeah, we knew right away all the screw-ups right away. But it was funny. Mm -hmm. Paul, we're going to end this. And, and I want you to, uh, what do you want to say to my audience? Just if you're thinking about getting into trouble, you know, because things are hard right now, think twice, because you're going to make more money working in McDonald's flipping burgers than you're going to make at 12 cents an hour, if you're lucky, in Uniform. a prison system, yeah. all right? And it's, it's not worth it, because the effect that you're having, you're not the only one going to jail. Your whole family's going to jail with you, and, and they're going to suffer the same way or worse than you are and for guys that have been in jail and they were like the head of the household when they come in and your wife stuck around with you and you come home don't think for one minute that you're going to be able to step back into the position you were in when you get out of jail because you're not it's not going to happen it's going to create a conflict between your wife and your family because she's become independent She's had to work. She's had to supply for your children. She had to take care of everything. And it's, it's really something that 
I, I tell my clients, you have to understand this. You know what I mean? Because it's not easy for somebody who is uh, like a, a manager, you mm -hmm. know what I mean, to not manage. It's, not, no. it's very difficult for people to adjust to that. And that's why more marriages are destroyed, even though the woman's well, stuck with them. I tell everybody home. the divorce rate is 95% if you go to prison, but more than three years. That's what oh, it is. Oh, yeah. But, uh, you know, Paul, I want to thank you for coming here. This is always fun. We're going to do more of this stuff because, obviously, everybody you can see, man is super intelligent and knows what he's talking about. And I'm loving this because this is kind of like my always home week, and you guys know I love that. Uh, I want you guys to make sure you like the video. Make sure you subscribe. Make sure you check out Paulie's stuff and please pass that word around because he can save you a lot of money. Not only save him money, save you the heartache, save your family the heartache, and save uh, time in your life because there's nothing, nothing that we talked about. We'll probably talk for another few hours. But I want to just thank everybody out here. Keep, keep doing what you're doing. Make good choices, man. It's not worth it. Trust us. It really ain't. It's really not. You have a, you know, a, a bright future. A lot of people talking about this country is oppressive and this and that it's not it's the greatest country in the world i agree we live in the greatest country in the world with the worst criminal justice system. we have we have we have listen we're the number one of incarceration in the world in not, the world. not only so, here. yeah and, and i do talk about that a lot we, we're, a lot we're here to change things. it yeah there's a and lot of things that have to change like re-entry that's what i'm wanting to get into re-entry because oh, uh, when, like i told you what, when what guys are coming out they, they they're lost they they're have lost. they have no assistance they don't have nothing Look at I've been home for how long? I'm just getting my license. I tell everybody you know that I mean? every day. Uh, my goal is to help people, and I do help when I can, like Paulie or every guys I know. We're going to try to help Nick in any way we can. And we want you to just think before you act. Please think before you act. Make sure you make good choices. It's not worth it. And trust us. Trust us. If you need any information, Paulie's links are in, in my uh, description right below. And you can get a hold of him. If you can't get a hold of him that way, you can get a hold of me. You know how to do it. And I will get you the message to Paul. Have a great day, everybody. Please stay safe. God bless. Hang in there.